By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And I'm so looking forward to today's episode because we have Elder Dragon Highlander 1993-1994. And this is this is just going to be so much fun. Like, this is, this is different. First of all, this match took about two hours. So, I mean, get comfortable. This episode is going to take a while. But it was such a fun game, and I'm so looking forward to show this to you. We've got uh, Jeff, who's uh, on the left top corner. He's playing Deccan Blackblade. And uh, then we've got Chris sitting next to him. He's playing Jacques Lever. And then we have Ishan, who's on Palladia Moors. And then I'm playing Nicole Bolas, the ultimate bad guy. So we all have legendary old school commanders for this match. No cards are banned, so that's the fun. You can play whatever you want. All the way up to Fallen Empires. You can also play the Harper Prism promo cards. So it's just a lot of fun. Now I've got lovely deck pictures of every single deck. Now before I dive into the deck text, first a quick message from our great sponsor, 3 for 1 Trading. 3 for 1 Trading is one of Europe's leading Magic the Gathering retailers. Their online shop has a fantastic selection of high-end Magic cards, especially for vintage, legacy and, yes, yes, old school Magic players. They now exclusively offer my community free, fully insured and fast worldwide shipping on all their high-end singles, full sets and out-of-print sealed products. They upload new cards every Wednesday and have weekly sale offers and reductions waiting just for you. Use my code TIMMY to get free worldwide shipping on your first order over $500 or euros. Have fun ordering those cards and thank you 341 Trading for sponsoring this video. Okay and we are back and ready to dive into the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of the player on the left top corner that is Jeff. He's also on the play aka Ragnar. Let's take a look at his deck. And here we see the deck of Jeff aka Ragnar. So he has Deccan Blackblade as his commander. Deccan Blackblade, a creature, one white, two blue, one black and two that has power and toughness equal to the amount of lands you control. So I think in this deck, he's really going to use the Black Blade as a finisher, right? And when I'm looking just at the cards here, obviously I'm not gonna talk about all of them because it's way too much, but I'm gonna talk about a few cards that I think could be key pieces in this multiplayer matchup. Um, he wants to kind of control the game. And then there's one uh, legendary creature that I noticed that is really good at that, and that's Lady Evangela. So Lady Evangela is a one, two creature for a white, a blue, and a black that has this ability, um, white and black tap, prevent all combat damage that will be dealt by target creature this turn. So it can really kind of take out one of the bigger threats. And of course you can also use this as a political tool during combat, right? So I can see cards like this, they could be quite good. Um, we also have a card Arena, which is pretty cool. It's a card from Harper's Bazaar. You can play that in, the, in our EDH 93, 94 pots. No cards are banned, by the way. So you can also play Caracas. We also have Caracas in here, which is pretty nuts. So, I mean, I mean I, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works when we're actually playing. Um, but anyway, Arena has this fight mechanic where one of his creatures can fight a creature of the opponent. Again, this is really a good political tool, right? Because you can say, okay, I'm not going to kill your creature if you're not using it against me or whatever. You know, you can you can have this whole line. Um, and then another card that I think is really good in this multiplayer settings is Tannis' Coffin. Also, because when you untap the coffin, the creature comes back tapped. So it means that your opponent can still not use that directly as a blocker, for example. So Tannis' Coffin can be really important. You can also, of course, use it at instant speed. So again, it's one of those cards I like, oh, that could be annoying. Right next to it is Icy Manipulator, kind of the same story. Um, and then we also always, have also, sorry, I won't say always, but I mean also, we also have this card that's always annoying in these matches, I feel. Um, I love it when I'm playing with it, and I'm talking about uh, Time Elemental. So Time Elemental is usually when you play one-on-one, -on -one, it's usually too slow. It can still be good, but usually it's too slow. Um, but in these EDH formats, Time Elemental can be really good, you know, because there's just, it's it's not as quick, it's not as efficient, people don't always directly have an answer to it, sometimes people don't want to because they maybe have some alliance together or whatever, another reason not to do it, um, so yeah, I think Time Elemental could be, again, this very annoying key card in the matchup, uh, a card that I really like is Reverse Damage, I think Reverse Damage 
is a beautiful card that unfortunately on one on one is usually not good enough. You can sometimes put it in the sideboard if you're, for example, playing against a heavy red player that wants to finish you off with a big fireball, then like reverse damage could be good, but usually it's just not good enough. But in multiplayer, these cards become better because there are just more different situations happening all the time. The game takes longer. There's a lot of unexpected things happening. And the reverse damage can really be that moment where, hey, all of a sudden you gain life instead of losing life. And that can be a tipping point in the game. Uh, okay, so this is the deck of uh, Jeff. Now let's take a look at the deck of the player uh, that's sitting on his right. That is Chris. And he's playing with Jacques Levert. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Chris. So Chris, uh, Chris, his commander is Jacques Levert. That's one red, one green, one white, and one for a 3-2 creature that reads all your green creatures gain plus O plus 2. So it's actually a 3-4 creature that's going to pump all other creatures. Usually when you have these anthem effects, you kind of want to play a token-heavy strategy. But of course, in EDH old school, there are not that many cards that make tokens. There are a few, but... <laughs> It is really tough. We do see Night Soil here, for example, card from Fallen Empires, which it could be quite good in multiplayer. It can make tokens for you. Um, and there are also a few cards that work together well with that strategy. And that's, of course, Castle, because Castle gives all your untapped creatures plus O plus 2. This used to be different, by the way. It used to be all your defending creatures get the bonus. But the Oracle text has changed. So now it's all your untapped creatures. And um, there's a little... Little combo here that um, uh, that Chris is playing, which I like because he's combining Castle uh, together with Johan. So Johan is a legendary creature, uh, one white, one green, one red, and three, a human wizard that reads, at the beginning of combat on your turn, you may have Johan gain. Johan can't attack until end of combat. If you do, attacking doesn't cause creatures you control to tap this combat if Johan is untapped, right? So um, if you don't attack with Johan, basically that's what it is, all your creatures get Vigilance. If they have Vigilance, they get the bonus from Castle. And of course, if you then also have Jacques Lavera, then your cre green creatures get plus O plus 4. So they become huge. Can you imagine your War Mammoth is now a 3-7 Trampler? I mean, I have to admit, it's still not very impressive because you only have 3 power. But still, I like that idea. I think it's really cool. Um, then when we're looking at the rest of the deck, and I'm going to try to take out a few pieces that I think are exceptionally good in, in this format, um, I'm looking at Aladdin's Ring. Aladdin's Ring is a card that's usually way too slow uh, in regular old school. But in, uh, in multiplayer old school, Aladdin's Ring all of a sudden is useful. It's 8 to cast, 8 and tap. And then you can deal 4 damage to any target. But if your game is going to take forever, you'll have more than enough mana to use this ring, to cast the ring and to use the ring. And again, this becomes one of those political tools where you can say, okay, I'm, I, can, I can deal four damage to your creature, but if it's not coming my way, you know what I mean? So Aladdin's Ring can, can uh, become really good. Another artifact that's quite good in this format is Arena of the Ancients, a card from Legends for three to cast that says legendary creatures don't untap during their controller's untap steps, right? So you can imagine that can be quite good in a commander game like this one. And also it combos really well with Johan because remember Johan gives all the creatures um, here of Chris um, uh, vigilance. So then your legendary creatures don't tap. So arena is not a problem. Uh, a card that's also really good, a life gain card that I've experienced as well myself is absolutely nuts. In multiplayer is Power Leech. Power Leech, a card from Antiquities and Enchantment for two green that reads whenever an artifact of an opponent uh, that an opponent controls becomes tapped or an opponent activates an artifact's ability without tapping in its activation cost, you gain a life. So this may sound like, okay, whatever, but if someone taps their Felwer Stone, you gain a life. If someone attacks with an artifact creature, you gain a life. Like, this adds up very, very quickly. This is a super good card, and, you know, it, it just could, could double Chris's life in no time, you know, if you have Power Leech on board. Uh, another card that I really like, another enchantment, uh, because we're playing multiplayer, is Smoke. Smoke is this card, again, you don't see a lot in one-on-one -on -one play, but it is a cool and interesting enchantment. It's too red to cast. Um, I always kind of see a little Labricon there, by the way, in the clouds. I don't know what you see with the lightning, but I always see a little Labricon figure. Um, but what it does is it says players can't untap more than one creature during their untap steps. Again, this goes together quite well with that whole Johan Vigilance strategy. Um, but I really like it because usually with these multiplayer games, the boards kind of get, you know, clogged up and there's a certain point when somebody's going to go, you know what, I'm going to go alpha strike, tap everything, attack. 
Um, but it, knowing that there's smoke, you have to think, hmm, I can only untap one creature after that. So it's it's it, it can have an impact on the game. Um, okay, so this deck here, Jacques Lever, again, a very different strategy than the deck and Black Blade deck. This deck wants to go wide a little bit more. That's the impression that I'm getting. Uh, now let's take a look at the third deck here on the table. That's a deck of Ishan. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Ishan. So Ishan is playing the same colors as Chris. A few cards are the same, but a lot of cards are different. Let maybe first uh, talk about the commander. He's playing with Palladia Morse, one of the OG Elder Dragons. So that's really cool. I'm also playing with an Elder Dragon, Nico Bolas. So we've got two Elder Dragons in our pod. Uh, Palladia Morse is two red, two green, two white, and two to cast for this Elder Dragon Legends. It's um, She's got Flying and Trample, and then, and then she has an upkeep cost of one white, one green, and one red. You've got to pay that during your upkeep, or Palladium Wars is buried. So all these uh, Elder Legend uh, Dragons have an upkeep cost, and if you don't pay it, the dragon is buried, goes back to the command zone uh, in this case. Then we also see Jacques Lever and Johan. So uh, Ishan is playing with both of those cards as well that Chris is playing with as well. So maybe... There's going to be some uh, some similarities in the gameplay, um, but there are also a lot of differences. One of the cards that I noticed here, two cards actually that I noticed that are really good in multiplayer are Earthquake and Hurricane. Uh, Earthquake is a card, one red and X, and deals X damage to each player. So you're playing with four players, right? So you get a lot of value out of that, but also to each creature without flying. So Earthquake can be this very good board wipe. And again, because you're playing multiplayer, they're always targets right sometimes when you're playing one-on-one -on -one with an earthquake or a hurricane you're like ah there's not really a good target it's like a deck card in your hand but with multiplayer they're always targets it's always it's, it's going to give you so much value and then hurricane does the same uh, as earthquake but then it's green and it does it for flying creatures so it deals x damage to all flying creatures and talking about that he's also playing with if biff freaks if biff freaks is a three three flying creature with a hurricane ability that everybody can use Right, so everybody can pay one green and then deal one damage to each creature with flying and each player, which is kind of nuts. Um, I think it's a cool card, but I'm not happy to see it in this case because I'm not playing with any green mana. So hopefully that doesn't find its way on the board. Another card that I hope is not going to find its way on the board is Lantex. Uh, Lantex is still an all-star in EDH today, and it is very much a very, very strong card in EDH 93, 94 as well. If Ishan can find the Lantex early, that's going to give him a huge advantage, right? So Lantex is an enchantment from white that during your upkeep, if an opponent has more lands than you, it allows you to uh, take three basic lands out of your deck and then shuffle your library. So you can imagine in EDH, that's kind of nuts, right? I mean, um, it's going to be really good. And he's playing with a lot of basics, by the way. Anyway, uh, this is the deck of Ishan. It's, it's looking good. I'm just, I mean, I can continue talking about this for another 10 minutes, but... I feel like I'm trying to make these deck decks, keep them a little short at least, so we can quickly go to the game. So this is the deck here of uh, Ishan. If you have any questions about specific cards, please let me know in the comments below and I'll help you to uh, try and identify them. Okay, now let's take a look at the last deck and that is my deck. I'm playing Nicol Bolas. Let's have a look. And here we see my deck. So I've built a deck around Nicol Bolas, the ultimate bad guy of magic, right? The classical commander. And I've decided to combine Nicol Bolas with my revised collection. I've got a huge revised collection, if I say so myself. I actually made a video about it, if you're into that stuff. Um, so it's always fun like to take them out of my binder and to, to build around it. And an EDH deck gives you so many opportunities to play so many cool cards. Um, I do have three cards that are not revised, though, in my 99. And those are the three captains of Nico Bolas. Maybe first focus on what Nico Bolas does and then I'll talk about the captains a little bit. Nico Bolas is two red, two black, two blue and two for a 7-7 seven, seven flying Elder Dragon and uh, it reads an opponent damaged by Nico Bolas must discard the entire hand and ignore this effect if opponent has no cards left in hand. Okay that's pretty obvious and then you got to pay a blue, a black and a red during your upkeep or Nico Bolas is buried, right? But you want to, I want to try to swing in at least once with Nico Bolas to destroy somebody's hand. That must be, that must feel so good to do that. So hopefully I can accomplish that in this game. Um, and like I said, I also have added the three captains of Nico Bolas, which is a Soul Canard, the Swamp King, a 5-5 five, five Swamp Walker. And whenever somebody plays a black spell, including myself, I gain a life. I think life gain is quite good in these games. So Solkanar, that, that ability could be useful. Solkanar, also Swamp Walk could be useful. 
Um, I'm also playing them with Tetsuo Umezawa. So this is a card, one blue, one black, one red for a summon legend, a 3-3. And if you pay a red, a black, black, and a blue and tap it, it destroys target tapped creature or target blocking creature. And a cool extra ability of this card is that Tetsuo may not be the target of an enchant creature spell. So you cannot play control magic on Tetsuo. Yeah, I'm really happy about that. Um, and then a third card, a card that I'm actually playing for the first time. It's been, it's one of those cards that's burning in my binder that, that I should play way more often. It's Gwenlyn de Gorgi. It's a one blue, two black, and a red. Tap it, target player discards a card at random and activate only during your turn. So I think Gwendolyn, because it's also a 3 5 for 4, and it has this random discard effect, I think it, this is such a good card. I really do. It's just, you do need the mana to cast it, but once it's on the board, it could be a big problem for the table. I can, I can, I can see her doing some work here. Um, then when we're looking at the rest of the deck, so again, I'm trying to kind of focus on cards that are, that have a big impact on a multiplayer format like we're playing today. I think, yes, I'm also playing with Earthquake, a card that I just talked about. Um, I also think that a card like Nevenerals Disc, that's a card we haven't talked about. Most of us are playing with Nevenerals Disc. And this is also based on experience because sometimes it's really hard to get rid, um, to get out of a specific situation, I guess. That's what I'm trying to say, out of a lock when an opponent has built this pillow fort. And then Nevenerals Disc is really your only way out. So I think it's really good. I believe most of us are playing with Nevenerals Discs uh, today because it's just really this big reset button and it can just be this relief for the table, right? Where you go, oh, okay, we've we've got an Evernose disc. We have a way to kind of reset the game and everybody gets a fresh start. So I think the disc is really good. Um, talking about destruction, I'm also playing with Shatterstorm. I think Shatterstorm could be quite good. Uh, two red and two originally from Antiquities destroys all the artifacts. That can be uh, can be quite nice, of course, in this format as well. I'm also playing with a, a living artifact, which I think is really cool. Or is it called Animate Artifact? I need to... I think it's Animate Artifact, isn't it? It's a card from Blue, an Enchant Artifact. And uh, when you play it on Artifact, that Artifact becomes a creature as well. So it's going to keep its original abilities, but it's also going to be a creature. And um, it gets power and toughness equal to its casting cost. So I'm looking forward to play this on my Aladdin's Lamp and have a 10-10. That's kind of my dream, right? That's what, <laughs> what I want to try to accomplish. Another card which I think is really cool in this match is um, Howl from Beyond. The reason why is that um, Howl from Beyond is instant speed. And if I have enough mana and there's a certain combat situation that I'm not involved in, I can have a huge impact with my Howl from Beyond, maybe even finish somebody off with the Howl from Beyond kind of out of nowhere. And I think that's really cool about EDH because you're playing with four people. So you can just meddle with combats of two other players. You know, you can go, you know what? It's in my best interest, interest if you die now. Howl from Beyond, or it's in my best interest if that creature dies, let's help the power and pump it up a little with the Howl from Beyond. I think that's really cool. Um, another card that's really big, I think that are also um, some other players playing with this card today, which is Pestilence. I've won various multiplayer games on Pestilence. It's really good, again, because you have this effect that counts for everybody on the table, and because it's an enchantment, you can use it multiple times. So, again, Pestilence can be... One of those cards that is just really, really good can be really nuts in this uh, multi in these multiplayer games. Okay, um, this is my deck. Again, if you have a question about the specific card, please ask me in the comments below, and I'll try to clarify it for you and tell you what kind of a type of card it is. Um, yeah, we've talked about all the decks, so I guess that only means one thing: we are ready to jump into this crazy game of EDH. And I believe it took a couple of hours, so. Um, Sit back, relax, get a nice drink, and uh, let's get this party started. EDH 9394 here about to begin. Jeff on the play. He's on Deccan Black Blade, white, blue, and black. Starting with a basic island, passing the turn to Chris, who's on Jacques Lever, that is white, red, and green. Starting with a basic planes, passing to Ishan, who's on singular colors, but he, he's playing Palladia Morse. So also on white, red, and green, he's starting with a Taiga into a Mox Pearl. Look at that ramping in turn one. Passing the turn to me, I'm starting with a Swamp. Tapping it for a Soul Net. Okay, that's that's pretty nice, early Soul Net. So one to cast, one mana to pay, and you gain one life every time a creature is destroyed. So every time a creature goes to the graveyard, here we see an Urborg being played out by Jeff. 
And you can tap that for black, a legendary lands, but you can also tap it to remove first strike or swamp walk from a creature. And Chris here playing a Jandor's Saddleback. Wow, lots of action happening here early in the game. So Yandor's Saddleback, you can use it to untap target creature. And let's see uh, if Ishan also has a, uh, a turn two play. Tapping the Mox Pearl. Oh, look at that, a land tax. Oh, this is so good for Ishan. Early land tax. Oh man, he's he's really gonna enjoy this card. Unless, of course, maybe Jeff or Chris has a disenchant. With my colors, it's gonna be hard to uh, to get rid of the land tech. So I'm playing a blue, black, and red. Playing Nicole Bolas, passing the turn here to Jeff. And Ishan, by the way, uh, played out a Rainbow Veil, a card from Fallen Empires, which is pretty cool. Every time you use the Rainbow Veil, you can tap it for any mana you choose, but then you have to give it to an opponent. So Rainbowville is kind of ideal with uh, with Lantex. Here we see Jeff tapping three. Oh, Hypnotic Spectre. It is now getting interesting because who is he going to attack first with that Hypnotic Spectre? Passing a turn, of course, uh, first, to uh, first to Chris. And Chris here having a uh, Runes of Troikar, I believe. Oh, actually taking it back. Okay. Oh, also playing a Rainbow Veil. Okay. <laughs> so I guess we have to keep track of where all these Rainbow Veils go. And look at this, a Preacher hitting the board. Wow, that's quite nice. And uh, now he has to give the Rainbow Veil to someone else. Wonder who's going to get it. He put, uh, puts a die on the creature, probably to indicate that it's no longer his. Looks like it's going to Ishan. So he's getting that card. Would kind of make sense because then he cannot use his land tax. Or, oh, look at that. I think I'm getting the Rainbow Veil. Look at that card that I'm just putting next to my land. I think that indicates that I have the Rainbow Veil. And this means that Ishan can actually use his land tax. And uh, we did agree with Ishan that it's okay if he first draws his card for turn then picks out the basics and shuffle his library just because his shuffling will take so long. So in case you're wondering why he's doing that the other way around. Playing a basic forest here for turn. He's gonna tap four, including the Rainbow Veil. Let's see what he can do for four. Oh, there's a Master of the Hunt. Okay, so this is a two, two creature, right? For two green and two, you can put a wolf token into play which is a 1-1 one, one green wolf token with banding, and it can only band with the other wolf tokens, by the way. And so the um, Rainbow Veil is uh, moving again. Not quite sure where it's going. I think to Jeff, maybe that red die there indicates his Rainbow Veil. Oh man, this is gonna be super confusing. Anyway, um, I'm playing a Sedge Troll. So more and more creatures here hitting the board, and I'm really curious to see uh, who Jeff is going to attack with his Hypnotic Spectre. I mean, in a way, it would make sense to attack Ishan because he's got uh, that card advantage going with the Lantex. And of course, he's also kind of ahead on board, I feel, with the Lantex and that Master of the Hunt. So there's the attack. I also wonder if Chris is going to do something with his Preacher. Let's first see where this Hypnotic Spectre is going to. So we can see the life totals on the screen, right? So let's see who's going to go down to 38 and has to discard a card it looks like it's Ishan yeah Ishan being attacked here it's also shuffling up his hand now he's doing a lot of shuffling this game <laughs> and now he's going to lose a card probably a land there are a lot of basics in there but who knows maybe yes Jeff hits something else so the first card picked oh Sarah Angel it's a pretty good one it's a pretty good hit from Jeff I wonder if this means that Ishan is going to attack with his Master of the Hunt. Uh, he's going to attack Jeff next turn. Anyway, Jeff passing now. Passing to Chris, of course. And Chris now has his uh, Preacher that he can use at any time. He is playing with the same colors as Ishan, so could consider taking over that Master of the Hunt. And here we see Chris playing the Runes of Troikar. Passing the turn, so this land comes into play tapped. When you untap it, you can tap it for white or tap and sack it for two white. And here we can see Ishan again using the land tax. 
I mean, this is just great for Ishan, right? Like the longer this tax is on, uh, is, is on the board for him, the better it is. Getting so much value out of it. Just a lot of shuffling. That's the downside. That's the price you have to pay. Now we do see, by the way, that he first uses the tax and then draws the card. Oh well, we'll just we'll just see how it goes. Let's see what he can do with all his lands. Gonna play a uh, basic mountain. Tapping four here. And there's a Rook Egg. So Rook Egg, an 03 creature from uh, Arabian Nights. If it dies, you get a 4-4 Bird token. So that has flying uh, at the beginning of your next end step, I believe. It's a pretty good defensive card, but it's not gonna stop that Hypnotic Spectre. Ooh, look at that tapping my Rainbow Veil. So I guess I'm gonna use it for a blue. Yep, using it for blue to uh, play the Tim, the Protocol Sorcerer. And of course, uh, the Protocol Sorcerer, he can take out the Preacher. But uh, remember, this is, of course, EDH. So there's a lot of political talk going on. I'm quite sure that I don't want to kill the Preacher immediately. And of course, Chris can also use the Preacher. Could steal one of my creatures. But remember, with Preacher, the player you're targeting gets to choose. So I can just give him my set draw instead of my Tim. And I guess Chris is just keeping it untapped to use it on the end step of Jeff's turn or just uh, as protection against that Hypnotic Spectre. Here we see Jeff tapping four. Okay, untapping again. I guess, did he use his Rainbow Veil? Yeah, because that's that red die. I'm thinking that's a Rainbow Veil that he got. Yeah, using that one to uh, play the Gem Day Tome. So Gem Day Tome is four and tap, and then you get to draw one card. A really good card in old school. And really good in this EDH game. Because these games tend to take really long. So there's again the attack with the Hypnotic. Oh, he's attacking me. Oh, that's bad news. I don't want to lose a card. So he's kind of spreading the Hypnotic Spectre damage here. And I guess in a way it makes sense. You don't want to have... You don't just want to target one player and create like this personal battle within the bigger battle. Um, but I do think, objectively speaking that Ishan really has the better board. Then again, I've got two creatures. I was still on 40, so fair enough. And then Jeff passing here back to Chris, I believe. And I gave Chris back his Rainbowville, by the way. Again, I think looking back at this game, I think I should have given my Rainbowville to Ishan actually, because he just keeps using his land text. He's gonna tap four now, Chris, by the way. Let's see what he can do for four. Okay, there's a castle. An enchantment that gives uh, all your creatures plus O plus two. So that means that Preacher is now a one three. Passing the turn to Ishan. Looks like I got the Rainbow Veil back from Chris, by the way. Yeah, and I mean, if if Chris would have given the Rainbow Veil to Ishan, I think that would have been better. Then he, he wouldn't have a Lantex activation, because now once again, he has the Lantex activation, because I got the Rainbow Veil from Chris, so I've got five lands now. Yeah, there we go. Ishan again, getting basics. Man, I'm so jealous at Ishan. Oh, 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 so much advantage. I feel like it, it, it gets really nuts if Ishan can also find like a Sylvan Library, for example, because you've got the shuffle effect and every turn you get to look at three new cards to pick to choose from. Tapping the Mox Pearl here. Okay, playing a Soul Ring. EDH All-Star. Let's see what else he can do. Still has a lot of mana. Kind of expecting him to tap the Rainbow Veil again. Okay, playing a Land for Turn. That's a Basic Plains. Gonna tap four, gonna tap five. So tapping the Rainbow Veil here. Okay, using the Master of the Hunt. Not quite sure why he's tapping five mana for that. Because you only need four, right, for Master of the Hunt. Two uh, green and two, I believe. Anyway, he's made the 1-1 uh, one, one Wolf token with Banding. I could, of course, kill it on end step with my uh, 
Protocol Sorcerer. I wonder what I'm going to do with my Tim. But let's first see what Ishan is going to do here. Tapping a red. Oh, he's going to play a Chain Lightning. Okay, what is he going to target? Maybe the Hypnotic Spectre or maybe it's Rook Egg. Both would be good targets. Could go for Rook Egg, but doesn't have red anymore too. If he would wait for a turn where maybe he could play and the Chain Lightning and have to have two red to choose another target. Look at that targeting the Hypnotic Spectre. So just killing the Hypnotic here. And I'm going to gain a life here with my Soul Nut. Look at me go. Soul Nut power. Going up to uh, <laughs> 239. Untapping, not using my Tim. Oh, my Tim still had Summoning Sickness, I think. And look at that. I picked my own copy of Rainbow Veil there. So I guess I got the Rainbow Veil. Yeah, I got it back from Chris. And Ishan actually didn't use his Rainbow Veil. I'm a little bit surprised because you would think with land techs, you know, you don't want to have too much lands. Then again, he's got... Five lands now, I've got six, so he's kind of in a good position. Attacking with the Sedge, I wonder who I'm going to attack. Jeff's all open, of course, and he attacked me with, with the uh, Hypnotic Spectre. So that would make sense. Oh, I'm attacking Chris, actually. Look at that, Chris taking three. I mean, I guess he was still on 40, but so is Jeff. Anyway, passing the turn. And uh, interesting now, by the way, because Chris has, of course, the castle now. The uh, preacher is a 1-3, so that means I can no longer kill it with the uh, Tim. But, of course, as soon as, uh, as soon as he taps it, it loses that bonus. Jeff, you're not doing anything, just passing the turn to Chris. So let's see what Chris can do. Playing a basic forest. So four mana for him. Misses red as his uh, third color. Okay, taps a green and two white here. Okay, there's a Basil Monolith. So Basil Monolith is an artifact. You can tap it to add three colorless mana to your mana pool. And then you got to pay three to untap it again. And he's going to use it straight away. So tapping four in total. Ooh, for a, um, a damping field. This is a card you don't see often. Card from Antiquities. And players uh, can only untap one artifact during, the, during their untap step. So it's kind of a winter orb for artifacts. It's a card you hardly ever see. And I think, I mean, it's pretty good, right? But of course, in white, you can also play, you know, Dust to Dust. Um, you can just simply play Disenchant, Divine Offering. That's probably why, you know, this card doesn't see a lot of play. But it's actually pretty useful. Passing the turn to Ishan. And Ishan, you can see him here choose. So he untaps his soul and keeps his uh, Mox Pearl tapped. Makes sense. And this is what I love about EDH. You see a lot of these cards that you don't see often. And, you know, they get their, their time in the spotlights. And you can actually see what they do. And some, some cards are better than, than, than you may expect. I think, for example, Master of the Hunt is one of those cards that can be really good in these long multiplayer games. And 1v1, the card's pretty bad. But anyway, Ishan uh, here having 38 life. Picking more and more lands out of his deck. I think he's really in the best position of the uh, entire table at the moment. Let's see what he can do. I wonder if he's also playing with the Winds of Change. That's also quite nice with the land techs. So there we see a forest, I think. Basic forest, kind of hard to see. So he's got lots of mana right now. I think he can even cast his commander here, Palladium Wars. He's gonna attack here with the wolf token and with Master of the Hunt. Who is he gonna attack? Who is gonna attack Jeff there? So Jeff uh, going down to 37. And he's going to discard two lands, passing a turn on end step here using my Tim. And I think, yeah, I think I'm targeting here the uh, the wolf token. And because I've got my uh, soul net and I also uh, get a life because tokens do go to the graveyard under the new rules. 
and they're finding an island here. So now I've got two blue. Almost have enough mana to cast my commander. Looks like I'm gonna attack it with the Sedge. Who am I gonna attack? Attacking Jeff here, look at that. So Jeff taking some hits. Dropping to 34, and I guess I'm passing turn to Jeff because on end step he's using his Tome for an extra card. Jeff finding a basic planes. Would be good for, for, for him to, uh, to get some defenses up. Maybe just a wall, a good old fashioned wall. Like Wall of Swords. I find Wall of Swords, I think, the best wall. What do you think is the best wall in old school? I think Wall of Swords. Four mana for a 3 5 flyer. Anyway, Jeff tapping for. Oh, look at this Nevenerals disc! Oh, this, this card can have an impact. This can have an impact. I do wonder though if you're Jeff, if you're like. I think he'd rather would have had a wall of swords to be honest because you don't want to blow up your own book. The book is so good in these matches. Then again, he's got no defenses. Maybe once he untaps it, he can use it as this, this threat, you know? If you attack me, I'll use the disc. And I think, okay, if you're Ishan, you're like, I've got my Rook X, so if you blow things up, I get a 4-4 flyer. Yes, he loses lots of creatures, including Master of the Hunt, and of course he uses the, uh, loses the land tax. But I mean, he's used the land tax so often already, got a lot of value out of that tax. Anyway, let's first see what Chris is gonna do. He's got four cards in hand. And he's just passing the turn, it seems. Then on end step, Ishan's probably gonna make a wolf token using that rainbow veil, of course. Or not. Oh, he's gonna make two tokens. He's got enough mana to make two tokens. Wow. That is impressive. I mean, this Master of the Hunt is going to be a problem. I think, I wonder what I'm going to do when it's my turn. Like, I could, for example, attack Ishan with the Sedge. Then Ishan's probably going to block on the Rook Egg, which I don't mind. Because that's just more incentive for Jeff to actually use his disc. Then again, it's risky in multiplayer when you do these things. Because maybe Ishan makes a deal with Jeff. Ah, it's, it's complicated. Anyway, Ishan first uh, taking on his turn. I wonder who's going to get that Rainbow Veil now, by the way. Because I've got Chris's Rainbow Veil. Because you can see Chris put a die on his Rainbow Veil. And Ishan just used his Veil. But where did it go? Anyway, it'll, I'm sure it'll pop up somewhere. I'll try to... <laughs> when I see it, I'll tell you. But first, Ishan again using the Lantex. Oh, there, there we go. So Jeff is picking up his copy. Anyway, Ishan again using the land tax. This is, this is tax number what? Five? Four? I mean, I'm really jealous of your uh, land tax, Ishan. And you can, just, you can see Ishan's board is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Which should be a serious concern for all of us. So he's picking up the three basics. Then going to draw for turn, or maybe he did already. Let's see what he's going to do. Yep, now he's going to draw for turn. Beautiful uh, Bird Maiden playmat, by the way. Really, really cool art. There is a, a forest being played out by Ishan. He's got so much mana. Ooh, is there any attack? Yeah, Master of the Hunt into the red zone together with the two wolf tokens. Ooh, is, is he attacking me? I think he's attacking me. I mean, fair enough. I keep killing his wolves. So I'm going to kill one, go up to 41 and take three damage. So end up on 38. Yeah, I'm not really happy about my position, to be honest, because I don't have... Don't have any way to draw extra cards. I do have that Sedge, of course. I could survive a blast from the disc. Finding a mountain here. And now I've got eight mana, by the way. I've got enough to cast Nicobolas. Is that smart? Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, let's first see what I'm going to do. Attacking with the Sedge. That is step number one. 
Looks like I've attacked Chris here. He's going to drop to a 34. And then in the second main, tapping everything. Look at this. Nicol Bolas hitting the board. 7-7 seven, seven flying creature. And I guess I'm really doing this to provoke Jeff to use his Nevenerals disc. I'm basically saying, Jeff, you have to use the disc now or else next turn my dragon will uh, wreak havoc. But maybe I can make a deal with Jeff. Say, you know what, Jeff, I'm not going to attack you with uh, Bolas. I'll attack someone else, don't worry. And Chris, by the way, is still keeping that uh, Preacher untapped. Let's first see what Jeff can do. Oh, is that a Caracas? I think he played a Caracas, so that's a, a land. You can tap for white, but you can also tap it to return target legendary creature to its owner's hand. And usually this card is banned in EDH, but remember, we ban no cards. So, <laughs> so we've got this card. And I, to be honest, I have my doubts. I think this card should be banned in EDH because now of course Jeff can every time when you cast your commander can you send it back to your hand or to the command zone for that matter so Karaka is definitely a card that uh, the table will have to get rid of so uh, Chris, Ishan and myself have the task to try to get rid of the Karakas. I don't think I'm playing with the stone rain by the way in my deck so that's a mistake And I think now if you're Jeff, there's no reason to use the disc. It looks like he is thinking about it though, because he's got the Caracas now anyway, so he doesn't have to worry about my Nico Bolas. Looks like he is using the disc, tapping it. Oh, look at that, he is using the disc, so I'm gonna deal one damage. I guess to Jeff, exactly, drop, drop him to 33, but look at this. And this is actually super bad for me because I'm now also losing the Satch. Didn't have mana open to regenerate it. And I think this is kind of good news for Ishan, right? Because he's going to get that 4-4 uh, bird token on the end step of Jeff. Let's see. Uh, Jeff, of course, also drew a card with his Jamdaytone. Can he play something out? Going to tap the Underground Seed, tap the Rainbow Veil. What are we going to see for two? Ooh, a COP red. Ooh, that's annoying, actually. My commander is red. Ah, the COP red's pretty good. And now the Rainbowville is gonna travel again. You can see Jeff kind of thinking, where to put the Rainbowville? I think he's giving it to Chris. Does it mean Chris now has two Rainbowvilles? Because he's putting that die up to two. There we see Ishan, by the way, put the 4-4 uh, four, four bird token in play. Yeah, I think Chris now has two, so he's got lots of mana all of a sudden. Including a red one, so it could cast uh, Jacques Levert. Oh, there we go, there's his own mountain. So this uh, could be an interesting turn for Chris. Okay, looks like he wants to tap the red. Yeah, not quite sure how he's sorting his mana. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I think I would put the Ruins of Troika down with your white mana, to be honest. Because it makes white, but... Oh, Pyrotechnics! Is he going to kill the 4-4 Flyer? He is! Wow! That's pretty aggressive. I mean, I'm happy about it. But Pyrotechnics, of course, is also one of those cards because it deals 4 damage and you can divide it any way you choose. So it's also one of those cards where you just go, oh, ping that one, ping that one, ping that one, ping that one. But uh, yeah, Chris uh, choosing to just kill the 4-4 uh, four, four Flyer, which is fine. I'm fine. I'm happy with that, actually. Here we see Ishan playing a lot of our elves. He now has to completely rebuild as well. And there's a Brothers of Fire. Yeah, Brothers of Fire, again, one of those cards that you don't see often in regular old school, but could be good here in this format. It's a 2-2 from the dark for 2 red and 1, and you can pay 2 red and 1, and you can deal any, uh, 1 damage to any target, but you also take 1 damage uh, yourself. And you can do that as often as you want. And here we see me playing the Often Troll, oi oi oi, 2-2 Regenerator. And I, I still wonder if it was a good move. I, 
to play Nico Bolas. I think this was more an emotional play, you know, of me last turn. I'm like, oh, I can cast Nico Bolas. I'm gonna play Nico Bolas because it's so cool. I don't think it was smart. Anyway, uh, Jeff's turn now. Ooh, he's doing something, doing stuff, tapping four. Oh, this is a um, uh, Tonus's coffin. And you can tap the coffin. You gotta pay two or three, I forgot. And then you can put target creature in the coffin. That means it's exiled from play until the cof coffin untaps. And then it the creature comes back tapped. So you can just target a creature, put it in the coffin. When you untap the coffin, the creature comes back into play, but taps. And of course you can keep Taunus's coffin tapped for as long as you want. So you can just keep the creature in there. Works really good with Triskelion. If you can put a Triskelion in there and then untap the coffin, Triskelion comes back and gets the uh, gets extra counters again. Oh, whoa, 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 discard. Um, Arena of the Ancients from, from um, Legends, an artifact that says all the legends or legendary creatures don't untap anymore. So Arena of the Ancients, again, a card that has a pretty big impact on the uh, legendary creatures. I think, you know, Jeff has the Caracas. Chris has the Arena of the Ancients. We're just never gonna cast Star Commanders anymore. Why would you with these cards in play? Which is kind of sad, actually. There we see Ishan playing a Mace, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, oh, okay. So I just said, why would you cast your legendary creature anymore? And look at what Ishan does. He's gonna cast Palladia Morse. That is super cool, Ishan. I love it. So 7-7 seven, seven, Flying and Trample. Elder Dragon. So EDH is actually named after these dragons. And the every Elder Dragon has an upkeep cost. So the Palladia as well, you gotta pay a white, a red, and a green during your upkeep. And for example, for Nico Bolas, for my Elder Dragon, I've gotta pay a blue, a black, and a red. And I guess, I guess Ishan can use his mace to untap his dragon if he attacks with it. So after damage is dealt, he could do that. I wonder if I can do anything. And I mean, look at Jeff, by the way. He's got the Karakas, the COP Red, and the Taunus' Coffin. So those are three really good defensive cards that he's got right now. So it's gonna be really difficult to deal damage to Jeff, I just realized. With those cards on the board. Anyway, let's see what I can do. Just passing the turn here? Oh, that's so bad. Just passing the turn, really? Oh, man. Keeping my off control on uh, blocking duty. I guess I could have attacked Chris with it, but I really think Jeff and Ishan are the, are the most dangerous players at the moment, especially Jeff, because he's got the Karaka, COP Red, and the Taunus' Coffin. It's, it's, the defense is just sick. Let's see what else he can do. Ooh, just passing turn as well. So just like me, not doing anything really, just passing a turn. Ooh, Chris counting his mana. He's got the double rainbow veil now, I think. So he's got two, three, four, five, six, seven mana. Could sec Troy care for two. But then he's got eight mana. Also not doing anything. Wait a minute. So I didn't do anything. Jeff didn't do anything. Chris didn't do anything. That's pretty sick. Oh, look at that. Jeff now uh, sending back the Palladium Morse here to the hand of Ishan, doing that on end step, I believe, of Chris. Could have done that during the upkeep if he wanted to, because then it would have cost um, Ishan some extra mana. Yeah, and this is the problem, of course, with that Caracas. As long as that Caracas is on the battlefield, why would you play out your commander? So I, I, I personally think it's worth to maybe consider banning Caracas, although I know charm of this format that we're playing together here is that nothing is banned, which is cool, but Caracas, uh, it's a difficult card to deal with. Anyway, Ishan here uh, tapping a red. Tapping the forests. 
is he gonna do here? Ooh, playing a Rock of Courageous. That's such a cool card. Three, three flying creature. One red and three. Yeah, that's a really nice card. Just, the, I also love the art of Rock of Courageous. You know that ship in the distance. It's really cool. And on this board, it's actually quite useful because Chris has no flyers. I have no flyers. Look at this, the Often Troll is going in. Oi, oi, oi. So I guess I'm attacking Chris, right? That's the only good attack. Yeah, Chris dropping to 32. Tapping everything, okay. Oh, Aladdin's Ring. Oh, that's so cool. I love it. So Aladdin's Ring, eight to cast, eight and tap. Deal four damage to any target. So this is a super slow card, but if it sticks on the board, I finally have some power here. Oh no, what, what, what's happening? Oh, Jeff played Divine Offering on it. Oh man, Jeff. I honestly thought that finally I would have like a card that would impact the board. I could, you know, it's a nice political card as well, but Jeff just killing it straight away, destroying it with his Divine Offering, which is really good because it also gives Jeff eight life. Look at his life total, he's back up to 41. It's gonna be so difficult to deal damage to uh, to Jeff. I think actually, if you're Ishan, you should consider attacking with your Lana Elves. You know? At least then you can deal some damage. And if Jeff wants to use his coffin on the Elves, fine, let him. Anyway, let's see what, uh, what Jeff can do. Jeff, you're no longer my friend, man, after killing this, this ring in the game, of course, in the game. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you back for this. If I can, actually. Which is going to be quite hard. Ooh, a Pestilence also hitting the board. Oh, Pestilence is so good in multiplayer. I've won uh, a game of EDH before. It's actually on the channel with Pestilence. It's so good. So it's an enchantment. You can pay one black and deal one damage to each player and each creature. And it destroys itself as soon as there are no creatures anymore in the game. It's, it's absolutely perfect. I mean, it's looking so good for Jeff. We just need, we need another Nevenerals disc here to destroy all this stuff on the side of Jeff. And even if we do, then he still has that Caracas, which is super annoying. Oh man, this is gonna be tough. Let's first see what Chris can do. And he's got that Arena of the Ancients. Is he just going to pass? Yeah, it looks like he's just going to pass turn here. So, yeah, Chris hasn't done anything in a while, actually. Just passing turn here to Ishan, who's, who's on 38. And I'm pretty sure Ishan is like me, worried about that Pestilence. Ooh, there's a strip mine, so he could strip the Caracas, then play out his commander again. That would be quite good. Yeah, it looks like he's going to use his strip mine on the Caracas, I hope. Yes, on the Caracas, taking it out. And he's going to tap 3-4. Ooh, he's going to tap a lot more. Is he going to recast Palladium Wars? Yeah, Palladium Wars hitting the table. This is sweet. This is really nice. The problem, of course, is I'm now realizing Jeff has its COP red. Palladium Wars is also red. So you still cannot hit Jeff with it. So actually, this is a problem for me, potentially, and for Chris. This Palladium Wars. Hmm. So that's not good. Anyway, tapping two red. Let's see what I can do. Tapping two black. Oh, flash fires. Ho, ho, ho. I'm the only player not playing white. Oh, this is brutal. I'm making so many enemies right now. And one of the things I'm doing as well, by the way, is I'm destroying the planes of Ishan, meaning that when it's his turn, he cannot pay the upkeep cost for his Palladium more. So I think that's the main reason for me right now to play that flash fires. I mean, that I'm a little bit afraid of that 7-7 seven, seven Flying Dragon. I mean, can you blame me? 
Flash fires. What an evil card. Hey, but I am playing Nico Bola, so I think Flash Fires kind of fits the evil villain um, character, right? Passing the turn here to Jeff. But I think, I think, I think everybody's my enemy right now after this Flash Fires. <laughs> so maybe it's not smart. I'm now still on 38. Let's, let's see what I end up with after this turn cycle. Is Jeff ever going to play out a creature again? That's a big question. It looks like the answer is no, because he's just passing turn here to Chris. And uh, Chris playing his commander, Jacques Levert. So remember, this commander gives all his green creatures plus O plus 2. Which is pretty cool. Passing the turn here to Ishan. Let's see what he can do. Yep, there goes the uh, Elder Dragon. Because he cannot pay the upkeep cost, because his planes is gone. I wonder how that happened. I'm pretty sure he's gonna attack me, at least with the uh, Rock Hydra. Oh, sorry, Rock of Kariches. He found another planes again, by the way. Attacking me for three, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough, fair enough. 35. That is completely fair. Counting all his mana again. I'm always a little bit scared when players do that. Are we gonna see something big from Ishan here? What is he going to do? Tapping. Is that six? Five mana. Okay, playing Jasmine. Is it Jasmine Boreal, I think? So four, five. Beautiful art. Kind of that 80s theme, but it's just a four, five vanilla. Not too worried about it. And of course, I've got the often troll to block. Oh, look at that. Jeff actually using his mana drain. This surprises me, the mana drain on this set, uh, Jasmine. I mean, yes, it's a 4-5 creature, but that's kind of basically all it is, right? Maybe he needs the mana for something. I wonder if he's going to do something with all that mana, because he is going to get 5 mana. Playing here a, a reconstruction. Oh, getting the ring back. I love it. <laughs> I wish I had one more land, because then he could play it out straight away. Not to wait a whole turn cycle before I can play it. Four cards in hand. Do I have a land? That would be ideal. But this is pretty cool. Using my reconstruction to get Aladdin's ring back. Yeah, just passing the turn here. And now, of course, Jeff having five extra mana. I really wonder if he's got a plan with that. He's going to use the five. Okay. Also tap a blue, tap a black. Oh, what's the name of this card again? Turnbull? Something? It's, it's, is it like a 5-5 five, five creature? I forgot. It's got pretty big stats. I remember that. And you can tap it for a black, I think. It's one of those legendary creatures that costs tons of mana and doesn't really do anything, um, anything good. But it's still a really cool creature, of course. Got lots of flavor. Wow, so he mana drained the Jasmine so he could cast this. Wow. Hey, I'm happy the mana drains out of the game, to be honest. And when I'm looking at this board, I still think Jeff is, is kind of the person to go after because he's got so much defenses. And I guess his creature is really good that he just played out in combination with the Pestilence. Maybe he's planning to use the Pestilence a little bit more. Chris here, uh, by the way, playing a Stang. So Stang is a 3-4 creature, also legendary. That uh, comes into play with a Stang Twin Token, which is also a 3-4. Now, if the token leaves play or Stang leaves play, both of the creatures are destroyed. So, uh, for example, Jeff could put the token into the coffin and that way kill um, the original Stang as well. I wonder if he's going to do that. Anyway, first is Ishan's turn. It's going to untap here. Ooh, and it looks like it's Jeff using Pestilence. Yeah, everybody's taking a damage and the Lanora Elves is gone. So he's used to Pestilence perhaps on end step of Chris. Exactly, on end step of Chris. Now Ishan's drawing a card for turn. 
Yeah, it's hard to follow all these uh, all these actions happening. Trying to look at four boards at the same time. And there we see Ishan playing out a forest. He's got a lot of mana, only has one planes though. So let's see what uh, Ishan can do. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank here. He is making space there, so I guess he's planning to play something. Tapping a white and a green and a red, okay. Dropping the red. <laughs> Where's the red? Oh man, okay, finding the red again. Tapping is, is difficult. Okay, there's his own Jacques Levert. So both players here playing with Jacques Levert, Chris and Ishan. Now remember the legend rule has changed. So it means you can have two of the same legends on the table as long as they're not on the same uh, board. And of course, uh, Jacques Levert also pumps itself. So it's actually a 3-4 creature for four mana, which is pretty decent. Okay, I'm gonna tap a lot. Probably gonna recast uh, Aladdin's ring here. Yep, there's the ring and I found a land as well, it seems. So three cards in hand for me. Now I'm really hoping that my ring is gonna, gonna live. I wanna use it at least once. I'm pretty sure Chris and Ishan are also playing with the Divine Offering. And of course my ring is a great target. Although I think that Tannis' Coffin is also a very good target. Anyway, let's, uh, let's first see what Jeff can do. Jeff finding another plane, a uh, uh, swamp, which is bad news because it makes his Pestilence better. Look at that, he's just passing the turn. Yeah, Jeff is really playing that control game here. Which is uh, really smart. Chris picking up his cards. See what he can uh, can do. I mean, he's got some legend action going, but remember that Arena of the Ancients also works against his legends. So if he attacks with the legends, they will not untap because of the Arena of the Ancients. I mean, he could consider attacking me, for example. I guess I'm the only good attack for him. But then, uh, like I said, the legends won't untap and he won't have any defenses. So I guess if you're Chris, you're probably not gonna attack. I wonder if he can play something out. Okay, there's the Abu Jafar. So just an O one though, which is, can easily uh, be killed with the Brothers of Fire or the Pestilence. So I wonder why he's playing this out. The castle would have been quite handy for Chris now to protect those smaller creatures. Anyway, um, yep, passing the turn here back to Ishan. So Ishan's gonna untap. And I almost get to untap and use my ring. Hopefully Ishan is not gonna destroy it. Finding a second uh, white, by the way. Counting his mana again. Is he gonna recast Palladia Morse? That would be cool and scary at the same time. So he's gonna tap a white, tap three green. Oh, Jam Day Tome, oh man. Oh, this is so good for Ishan. Also because he's got tons of mana to use the tome every single time. And he's got that maze, oh man. I think my ring is the only way to deal damage to Ishan or Jeff. For now at least. They're so well protected. I wonder if Ishan's gonna attack with the uh, Burt. I mean, he could consider attacking me. Or Chris. I mean, Jeff makes no sense with that circle of protection red still in the, in the game. Counting his mana again. 
passing the turn. Okay, not attacking me or Chris. Maybe he's worried about my ring that I will kill his bird if he attacks me. And look at this, an untapped Aladdin's ring. The world's at my, uh, my feet. I'm feeling very powerful now with this ring. Problem is I gotta almost tap out completely to use it, so obviously I'm not gonna play out anything. Ooh, look at this Jeff using the Tonus's coffin. What is he gonna put in the coffin? I'm worried now. Oh, he's gonna put the Stang token in the coffin, so that means Stang is gonna die. Yeah, Stang is so vulnerable. And I'm actually a little bit surprised that Jeff isn't just using his uh, Pestilence here. Because then he could have killed the Abu Jafar, he could have killed the Brothers of Fire, he actually could have killed a lot of creatures. If he would just pay four, and then he's got four black mana, he would kill both Shaklaveras as well, for example. Look at this, Jeff just passing the turn. Jeff is like, I don't have to do anything. I'm controlling the board as is. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just gonna do a little bit of things on end step. And I guess Jeff has a rainbow veil, by the way. This is funny. I wonder, I think maybe, I think Chris now has a rainbow veil and Jeff has a rainbow veil. But the longer we're gonna, we're gonna be in this game, the less, uh, it matters who's got the veil. I feel like this is a tough game for Chris, actually. Okay, he's gonna tap. Oh, he's tapping everything. Cool. What's he gonna do with all that mana? Oh, a desert twister. Oh, ho, ho, that's cool. What is he gonna twist? Looks like something on Jeff's board. But I wonder what, I wonder, like, there's so many good targets. I would be tempted to just take the CLP red, to be honest. Ooh, there's a counterspell though. Counterspell on the Desert Twister. And, oh, look at that, I'm playing a Spell Blast, countering the counterspell with the Spell Blast. So that means a Desert Twister will resolve. And now the question is, what does it target? Or does Jeff have something? I think it's targeting the Pestilence because he's now playing black mana, right? Do you see that? So one, two, three. Three black mana, four black mana. Five, five? Yeah, tapping the Rainbow Veil. So putting five black. That means five damage to everybody. Wow, that's going to have an impact on the board. Basically wiping everything. I get to uh, regenerate my often troll though. And I guess his legendary creature of Jeff isn't a 5-5. Five five. It's got to be like a 5-6 or something because it's surviving this pestilence of 5. We do see Ishana also activating his Brothers of Fire. So he's going to probably just deal a damage to Jeff here. Or, oh, an extra damage. Yeah, so it did have 6 toughness. Do you see that? That legendary creature of Jeff is now dead as well. Yeah, and I keep regenerating my often troll. Wow, but this was a very explosive turn. So Chris really set things in motion with the Desert Twister. Looks like I'm really asking here for the mana for the Lotus Veil from Chris. And uh, I guess, I guess, I mean, I earned it, right, Chris? Because I played the Spell Blast on the Counter Spell. But obviously, I had to do that, of course, for the table. But uh, there are still two cards on the side of Jeff that I would love to see go. That's Titanus' Coffin and the COP Red. Talking about I would love to see things go, Ishan also has two permanents there that, that I want gone. The uh, Maze, but even more importantly, the uh, Jam Day Tome. Let's see what Ishan can do here. Of course, lost a lot of creatures due to the Pestilence... Uh, Activation last turn from Jeff. Ishan here picking up another card. He's on 30 now, by the way. Ooh, there's Sir Chandelar! 
Oh, again, a card that you don't see often. Um, I believe it's a vanilla, and it's a 4-7. I think it's got seven toughness. It's like really big. Oh man, so cool you're playing with these cards. Sir Chandler reporting for duty. I think I think Sir Chandler is also red, which is annoying because it means you cannot attack Jeff with it. Anyway, it's my turn now. I'm untapping everything. Passing the turn. Look at this. So I'm just going to keep my mana open, probably to use for the uh, Aladdin's ring. Also, not attacking with the off control. I mean, I guess I didn't really have good attacks. Like, I could attack Chris, but that's that seems the wrong thing to do because he played a Desert Twister on Jeff. I could attack Jeff, but, you know, he's got COP Red. And Ishan, of course, has Sir Chandler and the Maze. So there weren't any good attacks, really. Look at this. Jeff is going to cast his commander, Deccan Blackblade, reporting for duty. How big is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a seven, seven, I think. Yeah, this is this is pretty nice. So a seven seven on the board. Now do remember that uh, Arena of the Ancients is still on the battlefield. And it looks like he's gonna pass his turn to Chris here. Yep, Chris taking the turn, untapping his lands there. Gonna tap a red, a green, and a white. Ooh, for his own often troll. It's hard to see, but it's a often troll 2 2. One red to regenerate. It's a great blocker, great defending creature. Now we see Ishan untapping for turn. And I mean, Ishan is also in a really good position here because he's got that gem detome. He's been drawing twice as many cards for the last. Two turns, I think, with that tome. So as long as he has the tome, he's fine. Oh, he's gonna recast his commander, the Lady Amors. Look at that. So the 7-7 seven, seven legendary dragon is back on the board. And remember, he's got the uh, mace to untap it, and now I'm using my Aladdin's ring. To deal 4 damage to what? To Jeff. Look at a Jeff dropping from 33 to 29. I think it's the only way to really deal damage to Jeff. So passing turn here. I am a little worried now because what Jeff could do if he wants to is put my off control in the coffin, attack me with his black blade. That would be very painful. It does mean that, of course, his black blade then doesn't untap anymore. So I'm hoping that he's not going to do it because of that arena of the ancients. Let's see what he can do. Just passing the turn here. Okay, that's kind of great for me. So Chris taking his turn. Tap a green and a white. And okay, there's an AO pile. So that's an artifact from Fallen Empires. You can pay two and second, I think, then deal two damage to any target. Or is it one and second? I can't remember. But what I'll do, I'll put all the cards on the screen for you guys so you can see. And there we see Ishan, of course, paying the upkeep cost for the uh, Palladium Wars. Playing another mana, that's a dual land, Savannah. Tapping two green, tapping a red. Another green, what are we gonna see? Okay, he's just gonna use his tome. I think as a table, we really need to get rid of that tome because it's gonna be a problem. It's gonna give Ishan the victory eventually. So much card advantage for him. And remember, he also had that land tax at the start of the game.
I'm just hoping that I'm going to draw my, uh, my Shatterstorm. Although then I destroy my own Aladdin's ring, which I don't want to. So Ishan in the tank here, passing turn out to me. On end step, I'm going to use my Aladdin's ring, deal four damage. I wonder to whom. Ooh, to Ishan, look at that. He's going to drop to 26. My ring is doing work. It's dealt eight damage already. I'm super happy with that. Finding a bad lance here. The only problem, I guess, is for me that I'm now making enemies with the ring. But then again, I got to use it, right? They cannot blame me for using it. It's such a cool artifact. Looks like I'm just passing turn to Jeff. Jeff not doing anything. Okay. Again, I feel lucky. Finding an island here. I guess if you're Jeff, you're like, okay, I don't want to attack with the Deccan because it's not going to untap. Fair enough. Passing a turn here to Chris. Ooh, Chris going to do something. Tapping lots of lands here. Okay, that's a War Mammoth. 3-3 three, three Trampler. I got to laugh a little because the creature is now so tiny compared to what's already on the board, you know, with Black Blade, with the uh, Sir Chandelar. With the Palladium Morse. It looks like he shot an attack, by the way, with the Morse. I missed that. And of course, it doesn't untap. I think it attacked Chris there. Wow, because he's on 18. I missed that completely. And I guess he forgot to use the mace to uh, untap it. There we see Ishan tapping four to draw a card. Yeah, I mean, Ishan's still in a good position. Could even consider letting the Palladium Morse die so that it goes back to the command zone, recast it again. And again, I'm using my ring. Let's see who I'm going to target. I mean, Jeff would make the most sense because he's the highest on the table. It looks like Ishan wants to respond to my ring activation. Ooh, look at this. Divine Offering again. So it looked like I picked Jeff. Jeff's dropping to 25. And now in Ishan's end step still, he's playing the Divine Offering. Oh, this is so bad. So basically what I've done with my ring, I've dealt, what, 12 points of damage, but I've also given, given 16 points of life, 8 to Jeff and 8 to Ishan, because they both played their Divine Offering on my ring. Oh, this is frustrating. I mean, the ring is such a cool card. Look at this recasting Nico Bolas using the Rainbow Veil for that, by the way. So recasting Nico Bolas, I think I kind of need Bolas as a, as a potential blocker here. For the Palladium Wars as well. Although it stays tapped though, but maybe for the Black Blade, but the Black Blade's bigger? Ah, I don't know. I guess the other three cards in my hand are just really bad. So it makes more sense to recast uh, Nico Bolas. I just hope that I can swing at least once with Bolas. And Jeff now using, oh, he's putting Nico Bolas in the coffin. Oh, that's so bad. Now it's coming back. The problem is it comes back into play tapped and Chris has Arena of the Ancients. So it's not going to untap. So now I'm in the same boat as uh, Ishan. Ah, oh, this is so annoying. I mean, first Caracas, then, then Arena of the Ancients. It's difficult to play with your uh, commanders this way. I guess I should just board a more land destruction artifact uh, removal. Artifact destruction. Anyway, let's see what uh, Jeff's going to do. He's going to tap a white, tap two, oh, sorry, a blue, tap two, black. Ooh, Time Elemental. Oh, that's such an annoying card. Time Elemental is an O2. You can pay two blue and two and tap it and return target permanent to its owner's hand. So you can see how powerful this can be. It looks like Chris is immediately, immediately using his AO pile here to kill the Time Elemental. Thank you, Chris. Chris for president. I have to say, Chris is being quite good at kind of destroying 
permanence here with the Desert Twister and now with the AO Pile. And I've been quite bad at that actually. I haven't really played any uh, removal, I believe. Anyway, let's see what Chris can do. It looks like he's just passing the turn. Here to Ishan. Yeah, exactly. Ishan going to take his turn. Or not. Yep, he's going to take his turn. Okay, so he's going to let the Palladium Morse die. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not going to untap anyway. I wonder if I'm going to let my uh, Nico Bolas die. Oh, it's so annoying to have that Tansus coffin together with that uh, Arena of the Ancients on the battlefield. Anyway, Ishan here drawing for turn. So Ishan has the highest life total at the moment, by the way, after that Divine Offering on my Aladdin's Ring. He's on 34. See what he can do. Ooh, passing the turn to me, just not doing anything. And it looks like I'm paying my upkeep costs here for the uh, legendary dragon. That surprises me a little bit. I wonder if I have some kind of sec outlet or plan with it. Or maybe I'm just hoping that somebody's going to destroy the uh, arena of the ancients. Or maybe I found something against it. I think that Shatterstorm that I talked about earlier is looking really good right now. I mean, that would destroy the coffin, it would des destroy the Arena of the Ancients, and it would destroy the Jamday Tome. Oh, look at this, Jeff! Putting my off control in the coffin, then releasing it again, but it comes back into play tap. That means I'm completely open. Is he going to attack me with his uh, Deccan Black Blade, which is now, after playing out the land, a 10-10? Don't do it, Jeff! Don't do it! Oh no, is he gonna is he gonna slam me hard with his uh Deccan? He is, I think. I'm gonna drop to 18! This is really bad. This is really bad. Yeah, look at that. Going down to 18. I've got a really big problem because I I, I have nothing, I think. I have nothing going on in my hand, or else I would have done something. Oh my 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 my. And I mean, he can just attack me again next turn, do exactly the same thing. Then I'm on, on 8. Oh, this is so bad. This is so bad. I think he passed the turn to Chris, by the way, after that attack. And he untapped uh, the Deccan, of course, with his mace. This is so bad. And here we see Chris playing a Yoshin uh, soldier. 1-4 one, uh, one creature from Antiquities that doesn't have to tap when it attacks. Ishan again uh, uses his Jam Day Tome here on end step of Chris. Yeah, I think I think Ishan and Jeff are really the two players here on the board at the moment. They have actually kind of been from the start of this game, been very dominant. Here we see Ishan going through his graveyard, so I wonder if he has a regrow, for example. Thinking about Master of the Hunt, it seems. Okay, putting another card aside there. I wonder what he has. Regrowth or Raise Dead. No, it doesn't play with black. Paying four. Oh, just drawing a card. Just drawing a card. He's drawing so many cards. He also had the land tax earlier. Man, I wish I had uh, such good draws. There's a pass from Ishan. I'm going to untap. Not paying the uh, cost for uh, Nico Bolas anymore, by the way. So going back to the command zone. 
I mean, I'm in a really bad spot. If Jeff wants to kill me, he kind of can. He can put the often troll again in the coffin and attack me with his 10 10. Four cards in hand. I wonder what they are. Just passing turn. Luckily for me, though, uh, Jeff is not uh, putting my uh, often troll in the coffin, so that's something. Yeah, I really wonder what Jeff's going to do. Not quite sure how many cards he's got in hand at the moment. Okay, he is going to do something here. Tapping a bunch of lands. Ooh, there's the Hive. That is pretty good, actually, because he's controlling the board anyway. So the Hive is an artifact for five. Five and tap make a Wasp token. And this may sound pretty bad, which usually it is. But in multiplayer, in this scenario, it's a very good card. Jeff can start making one ones. It's really good. Ooh, it looks like Jeff wants to use his coffin. Or not. I wonder if Jeff's gonna attack with the deck. And he's got five cards in hand, by the way, and I see the die there, indicating how many cards he's got the black one next to his deck. So five cards in hand for Jeff and 25 life, five cards in hand for Chris and 18 life. And then Ishan, not quite sure how many cards he's got most uh, life of the table and 34. I'm also on 18. So Chris and I are kind of uh, in danger. Which is not surprising, because in all honesty, we've we've really been just uh, just on the on the bench. It kind of feels in this match. Ishan and Jeff are really the two players that uh, are having the biggest impact here in the best boards. Let's see what Ishan can do. And I mean, remember, he keeps drawing more cards than all of us. Oh, making matters even worse. Ivory Tower. <laughs> oh man, this is so bad. Maze, Ivory Tower, Gem they told and of course it's Sir Chandelar with seven toughness. I think I think as a table we now really have to try to find a way to kind of punch through Ishan's defenses and uh, start attacking him because this is getting out of hand. And it looks like I've taken on my turn. Tapping a lot here. Wow, what am I gonna do? Whoa, a huge fireball. What am I pointing the fireball at? It could do a lot of damage to Ishan, for example, but of course that black blade is a big problem for me as well. Counting the amounts of lands. Yeah, targeting the deck and black blade. I'm a little bit surprised. Then again, of course, if Jeff wants to put my troll in the coffin again, he can just attack me again with the Black Blade. And yeah, I'm pretty worried about that as well. So it makes sense. And hopefully for me, Jeff doesn't have enough mana to immediately recast the Deccan. But at least this Fireball is going to give me another turn of not being attacked by it. And uh, we see uh, Ishan doing something here. So he's going to draw a card. And oh, look at that. Jeff has put the um, Sir Chandler in the coffin and it comes back into play tapped. So that's why it's tapped right now. And it's not going to untap eh, because of that arena of the ancients. So again, Jeff pretty much in the, in the driver's seat here. Could recast the deck and I think he's got enough mana. Maybe he's got better options or maybe he wants to keep mana open to make a wasp token and use his uh, coffin. That would make sense as well. It looks like uh, 
Is it Chris's turn already? Not quite sure. Yeah, it is. And he's already passed the turn to Ishan, so not uh, doing anything here on this board. Could have attacked Ishan there. There was a little opening. Could have dealt some damage to him. And of course, Ishan needs to keep that uh, Sir Chandler tapped because of the Arena of the Ancients. There we see Ishan drawing another card. Yeah, and this is, I mean, this is really getting out of hand. Look at this, he's gaining four life, meaning he's got eight cards in hand. Now drawing card number nine. Yeah, this is really a big problem for the table. There we see Ishan tapping a green, tapping a white. And yeah, now tapping Sir Chandler again. Yeah, that needs to stay tapped because of the Arena of the Ancients. I mean, we have to get rid of the book or the Ivory Tower, preferably both. But uh, still his turn. Okay, playing a giant spider, 2-4. Creature that can block uh, creatures with flying. So the keyword reach is uh, based on uh, this creature. The giant spider, the first creature with reach. And then, of course, you also had web that would give a creature reach. And then Ishan here passing the turn. I'm just really hoping to draw an artifact that can draw me cards. Like Ring of Renewal, J.M. Dayton, Book of Rass. I guess I'm not even playing Book of Rass or Ring of Renewal in here. Or J.M. Tome. Oh, man. Anyway, oh, animate artifact. Okay, what am I gonna animate? Oh, I'm animating the ivory tower and then playing a lightning bolt on it. Oh, that's kind of funny. <laughs> that is funny. That is a pretty, if I, that's a pretty cool play, if I say so myself. So, I mean, look at Ishan's life total. It's getting out of hand. I have to do something. So I'm using two cards here to kill the ivory tower. Also playing my own... Uh, Jandor's uh, saddlebags here. And, and kind of, I think what I'm hoping to achieve with this as well is showing the table. Okay, guys, look, I'm dealing here with Ishan's tower. Now, Jeff, it's your turn. Do something against the book. Or Chris, it's your turn. Do something against, I don't know, the maze or the book or whatever. Trying to, to create some goodwill, I guess. Passing the turn... Uh, Back to Jeff, I think. And I guess Jeff has made a 1-1 uh, one, one wasp token. I guess that card uh, represents a 1-1 one, one wasp token with the hive. And uh, two cards in hand for me. Let's see what Jeff can do. Is he gonna recast Deccan? He is gonna recast Deccan. And I guess now, by the way, with the gender of settlebacks, if Jeff would put my uh, off control in the coffin and if he would release it again, I can at least untap it with the gender of settlebacks. So that's something. And it could, of course, untap my uh, Nico Bolas as well. So maybe I could recast that. Looks like Jeff isn't recasting his uh, Deccan, by the way. Just looked at it. And I believe passed the turn here back to Chris because he picked up his hand. Six cards in hand for Chris. Ooh, he's counting his mana. What is he gonna do? I mean, his side is a little bit glitchy, but uh, he's tapping a lot of mana here. I wonder what we're gonna see. Oh, he's gonna play a Tetravis. You can see that there coming in from the right. So Tetravis is a 1-1 one, one flying creature for six that comes into play with three plus one plus one counter. So it's actually a 4-4 four, four flyer from Antiquities. During your upkeep, you can take a counter off. And I create 1-1 one, one Tetravite tokens with that. And I mean, it's a flying creature. There are not a lot of flyers in this game. And there we see Ishan uh, taking his turn. By the way, he's playing a Lay Druid. So that's a 1-1 one, one creature. You can tap the Lay Druid to untap target land. So that's really good with the maze. It's like he's got two mazes now. So this is like 
extra security for him, which is something we really don't need because he's already on 38 with the book. And it looks like he's passing the turn back to me, so I'm uh, reorganizing my lands. Tapping three red and a blue and two black here. Okay, what am I going to do? Lots of mana. A Sheevan Dragon! Yeah, that's really cool. 5-5 five, five Flyer. Oh, I love it. That is kind of nice. It's not going to do much on this board because Ishan has two mazes of if, and of course Jeff still has that COP red. And we see Jeff here on NSEP again making uh, another Wasp token. Those Wasps are also great blockers, of course. 1-1 one, one Flyers. I mean, Jeff can just block for days. He's got COP reds, he's got maze, he's got the... The coffin, and now he's got all those wasps. It's going to be so tough to deal combat damage to Jeff. Anyway, Jeff uh, tapping lots of lands here. So is he going to recast Deccan? Yes, he is. Deccan coming back in. Such a cool creature. Love the art as well by uh, Richard Kane Ferguson. Really, really cool. And it's, uh, it's a pretty big creature now as well, by the way. And we see uh, Jeff here uh, going away for a second, passing your turn to Chris. Let me know in the comments below, by the way, if you're watching this video in one go, because then you have my admiration. Because <laughs> this, this is long, man. This is a long game. Anyway, we see Chris uh, untapping here. And I actually, I actually um, speeded up this as well. Like this is going at a 120% speed in, instead of 100%. So it's going a little bit faster. Ooh, there we see a Divine Offering. I wonder what he's going to target with the Divine Offering. Is he going to target the um, Thanos' Coffin? I hope so. Ooh, he's going to target the Hive. Yeah, that's a good target. To the problem is every time... Uh, when you want to, you know, destroy something on the side of Jeff, he has so many good targets. So in this case, he's going for the Hive, which makes sense as well. And Chris gaining five life here from that also going up to 23. But I mean, that coffin is also super irritating. But I guess you've got to stop him from making tokens. So I get this as well. But it kind of reminds me of, of the moment that Chris played the Desert Twister earlier in the match where he targeted the Pestilence, which was a very good target. But again, you're like, okay, he also has... COP Red, the Maze, the, the, the Coffin. He's just got so many good targets. I'm still really hoping on finding uh, my Shatterstorm. And of course, for Chris, the Jam Day Tome also would have been a great target. But yeah, there's only so much you can do. Anyway, Ishan here uh, taking his turn. And it's still looking so good for him because for the simple reason exactly that he has that Jam Day Tome that he can keep using. He's drawing so many cards. I think I think maybe as a table we have to kind of take on Ishan at the moment with that double mace, kind of force him to use that mace multiple times. Anyway, here we see a Sylvan Library. So again, Ishan has found a way to, to draw even more cards. And now he also has card selection, of course, with the Sylvan and... Yeah, the Sylvan is so good with the uh, Jam de Tome combination. So we see Ishan passing a turn back to me. I'm playing a Royal Assassin. Okay, that could do some work. Royal could take down the Lay Druid if Ishan uses it. I wonder if I'm going to do something with my uh, Shivan Dragon. Yeah, I'm going to attack with Shivan Dragon. But who to attack? I mean, Jeff is COP Red. Ishan's got Maze. Maybe I want I want to force Ishan to use the Maze. That could be the case. Or, oh, look at that attacking Chris, actually. Hmm. Not quite sure if that's the right thing to do. But Chris uh, blocking here with his Tetravus. So it doesn't want to take the damage. And then now I'm passing the turn. I'm a little bit surprised that I attacked Chris, to be honest, because I think Chris is not really the threat at the table.
Anyway, let's see what Jeff can do. Let's see if my Royal can survive, actually. It's always kind of tough for these 1-1 one, one creatures to survive. But we'll see. Six cards in hand for Jeff. Or seven, actually. Okay. Passing the turn to Chris here. And hopefully, hopefully Chris is not going to destroy my Sheevan, which he has every right to do after I just attacked him with it, but I hope not. He is going to play something. Ooh, a Chain Lightning on my Royal. I think on my Royal. Oh man, this is just... Which wasn't smart to attack him with the Sheevan, to be honest. I started this. Anyway, sending the Chain Lightning back... Anishan's uh, Lay Druid. Oh, that's kind of nice. So destroying his Lay Druid. And now Ishan also has two red, so he can continue the chain. Oh, this is funny. So Chris played the Chain Lightning on my Royal Assassin. I played two red to pass on the Chain Lightning. Then to Ishan, played it on his Lay Druid. Now Ishan is using his uh, two red mana to play the Chain Lightning on the War Mammoth of Chris. Okay. And Chris actually could consider sending it somewhere as well. He's paying two. Could you send it to the dome? Maybe to Ishan or to me. Again, I did attack him with the Sheevan. I wonder, okay, so three damage marked on my Sheevan. So now I could pay two red and, and send it back to Chris or to Ishan. So this is an interesting move, by the way, by Chris to kind of put it on my Sheevan. I wonder if he has another plan. I hope not. I really want my Sheevan to survive. I think it's probably best to send, to pay two red and send it to Ishan. Because Ishan doesn't have any red mana. I believe not enough to send it back. Only has it Hammerheim. But look at this, not doing anything with it. Just saying, you know what? I'm going to let it go. Probably worried. But looking at it now, I think I could have sent three damage to Ishan without any risk. Ishan, I believe, only had that Hammerheim open. Doesn't have a Rainbow Veil, for example, at the moment to make that second red. So I think, I think I kind of missed three points of damage here. And Ishan, of course, looking at the top three now, by the way, because of his uh, Sylvan Library. And that Sir Chandler should remain tapped. So... Hopefully the table will remind Ishan that uh, he needs to stay tapped. He has to take care of that Arena of the Ancients first. Exactly tapping it down now. Oh man, what a match this is. And I, I think we're still kind of stuck, to be honest. Also because I kind of feel like that the table is not really working together, but then again that makes sense because kind of Jeff and Ishan are kind of on the same power level, I feel. Although I think Ishan is really the bigger problem at the moment because of that Jam Day Tome. He just keeps drawing so many cards. Especially in combination now with that Sylvan. Okay, attacking with the Sheevan, who am I gonna attack? I believe I'm attacking Ishan here, so Ishan has to make difficult decisions. Does he want to put the spider in front? Does he want to use the mace? And the reason that maybe he doesn't want to use the mace is because, um, because of the fact that then he cannot use the mace on other creatures, of course, of the uh, of Jeff or, or Chris. So he's going to draw a card here. Oh, and look at this! Jeff is putting the, the giant spider into the Thomas's coffin, so making it difficult for Ishan here. So is Ishan going to use his mace here on the Sheevan Dragon? I mean, he could, then he takes no damage, and then Jeff could attack with his Deccan, but look at that land there on the side of Ishan. Did he play that this turn? I missed it. I don't, I'm not sure when he played it, but there's a Caracas on the side of Ishan. Oh God, that's a problem. Anyway, let's first see what Ishan is going to do, if he's going to use the mace. It looks like he's not because I'm tapping some red mana here. 
But now in response, he still can use the maze, by the way. So dealing eight points of damage here to Ishan. Look at that, going down to 30. And play, uh, playing a uh, Orcish Artillery. So Orcish Artillery, a card for two red and one, a one, three creature. You can tap it to deal two damage to any target and deal a three damage to its uh, controller. So Ishan getting the Giant Spider now back from Jeff. Tapped, of course. I wonder if Jeff's also gonna attack. I mean, he might as well just attack with the two Wasp tokens, just get a damage in. I don't think he's gonna attack with the um, with the, the Deccan, because Ishan can just send it back with uh, the Karakas. Look at that, Jeff attacking with the Wasp tokens. Oh, and with the Deccan. I wonder if the Deccan's coming them my way, or maybe Chris's way. But Chris also has the Uften Troll, of course. It looks like it's coming all to Ishan. Ishan using the Karakas, sending back Deccan, and of course Jeff is going to put it in his hand, not into the command zone, sending back one of the wasp tokens, it seems, with the maze. So, I mean, in hindsight, Ishan could have used the maze on my Shivan, actually. So maybe he also forgot about the Karakas, that he had it and kind of saw it now when Jeff was attacking. Anyway, Ishan taking one more damage from that single wasp token, dropping to 29. And uh, is Jeff going to recast Deccan? And he's got all the mana. Yeah, Deccan's back. <laughs> Guess who's back? Back again. Yep, Deccan's back. Oh, man. Deccan Blackblade. Back to the party. But this is an interesting... Uh interesting situation now right in the game everybody kind of trying to deal damage to Ishan I wonder if Chris is going to join the party he can at least attack uh, with the Yochin soldier he doesn't even have to tap it oh Jeff's doing more tapping the Rainbowville oh anime dead okay okay what do we have I got a royal of course and let's see everybody going to dive into their uh, graveyards so I've got a royal a sedge a protocol sorcerer and a mighty lord of the pit and then uh, on the side of Chris, we just see a lot of mediocre creatures, to be honest, like a War Mammoth. Oh, the Tetravis could be okay, but if you want to have a big bad flyer, you, you might as well just get um, the Lord of the Pit. Jacques Lever could be an interesting target for Jeff, although he doesn't have any green creatures. Master of the Hunt, again, doesn't have any green mana. Sarah Angel could be a target. I think I would go for Royal. Oh, look at this. He's going for Lord of the Pit. Ah, oh, that's so cool. So Lord of the Pit is now a 6-7 because the anime that gives the creature minus 1, minus 0. Oh. That's very cool, Jeff, that you got the Lord of the Pit. I respect that. And remember, he took it out of my hand with the Hypnotic Spectre all the way at the start of the game. So he did that with this bigger plan to get it for himself with the anime that. That's pretty cool. And of course, he's got two wasp tokens to sack to it. Anyway, let's see what uh, Chris is going to do now. Okay, playing. Oh, this is one of those uh, Thalits from Fallen Empires. Um, what's the name again? I think it's Thalit Devourer. And you, you, like you get um, a counter on it. You can, during your upkeep, and you can pay three counters to get a 1 1 Suprolling token. And you can also sack the Suprolling token to give the Thalid Devourer plus one, plus two, I think. Anyway, we also see Chris here attacking Ishan for one point. Yay, go Chris! So Ishan dropping to 28. So finally, as a table, we managed to get Ishan a little bit down on life. He's still the highest of the table, by the way, on 28. Followed by Jeff, who's on 25. Chris, who's on 23. And I'm the lowest on 18. But uh, I am feeling kind of good about my position right now because at least I've got a mighty Shivan Dragon and the Orcish Artillery is kind of handy. But um, yeah. Let's see what else is going to happen. Let's see what Ishan can do. And I'm still... The problem... 
of the Jamdek Tome is still there, you know? That hasn't changed. So I still think Ishan has the best uh, papers to actually win this game. I mean, look at the amount of cards in hand. He's got eight cards now. Maybe even nine, who knows? Anyway, he's gonna play a Mox Ruby. Tap two white. Okay, tap two more, so four in total. What's he gonna cast for four? Oh, there's a um, uh, sorcery from white. Resurrection can bring back target creature from his graveyard onto the battlefield. Very cool card. I think it's a little bit underplayed, to be honest. I remember playing Resurrection and Wrath of God all the time, back in the day. But anyway, using his Resurrection to get back uh, Jacques Levert. And that's going to make his Giant Spider a 2-6. And of course, uh, like I said before, Jacques Levert also pumps itself, so it's a 3-4 creature. Ooh, there we see an If Biff Afrit. Oh, ho, ho. this card can have some impact. If Biff Afrit, a 3-3 three, three for two green and two, and you can pay one green, and then you deal one damage to each player and each creature with flying. And the cool thing is everybody can do that. So if you have green mana, you can use that ability of If Biff Afrit. If Biff Afrit now being a 3-5 because of Jacques Levert. So that's some really sweet synergy. Yeah, this is really good, and this is kind of a problem because he's got a lot of green mana. Oh, playing a terror immediately on the If Biff Afrit. Hmm, this is this is a moment in the game because now I think Ishan is kind of forced to use his If Biff straight away. How much green mana does he have? Let's see, because he's got two basic lands. He's got that. Um, Tap land from Fallen Empires that he can sack, so that's four green. He's got Pendlehaven, five green. He's got Taiga, and I believe that is a Savannah. So he's got seven green mana in total. Wow, that is huge. He can kill Lord of the Pit and the Shivan Dragon, which is actually not too bad for, uh, for Ishan. And deals seven damage to everybody, and he is on the highest life total. Wow. I mean, life keeps getting better for Ishan here. I wonder if this terror was the right move. I'm, I guess I'm forcing Ishan's hand, like he's gotta basically kill his own creature immediately, but yeah, I could have waited. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm wasting the terror here a little bit because I could have attacked him next turn with the Shivan, and kind of force him to maybe use the, uh, the if biff or not, just let's just see what he does. I mean, terror is an instant, I can always use it. Okay, it's showing that synergy here between uh, Orcish Artillery and the uh, Saddlebacks. Playing out an underground sea. Can I recast uh, Nicol Bolas? That would be kind of cool. We haven't seen him in a while. Okay, I'm getting... Uh, a rainbow veil from somewhere. Guess I got it from Jeff. I am gonna recast Nicol Bolas. He is back, baby. This is what, the third time I've cast him? I think so. Anyway, playing Nicol Bolas again. I'm just hoping that I can at least swing in with Bolas at least once. I mean, I'm on 11. I'm close to dying. I just want to attack with him once. But it's really hard to get a good attack because I've got Jeff with COP red. I've got Ishan with his maze of if still. So the only good attack is Chris. But do you want to attack Chris? I mean, I kind of need Chris as well. It is difficult. One card in hand, passing the turn, I guess, to Jeff. I'm just really happy with the saddlebags. At least I can untap my uh, Nico Bolas if he puts it in the coffin and releases it again. He cannot do that trick anymore. There's a blue for a soul ring from Jeff. What else is he gonna do? 
That is the big question. So the Deccan, it seems, is a 12-12 at the moment. Now remember, it doesn't have trample, so you can just block it on a creature. It soaks up all the damage. Tapping two black here. Ooh, Demonic Tutor. Ooh, that is interesting. That is interesting. What is he going to tutor for? Demonic Tutor. Oh, man, another really good card. It's in my deck as well. And, uh, oh, it looks like he's taking... Uh, really, is he taking that card? <laughs> That's uh, the Timmy on the stick. Rod of Ruin. That's it. I'm Why would he take a Rod of Ruin? Rod of Ruin is three and tap deals one damage to any target. I wonder, wh what's his plan with Rod of Ruin? I'm a little bit puzzled. But uh, maybe there is a deeper reason for Jeff. Also nice of him, by the way, to show it to all of us, the card that he's picking. That's, thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. You're probably just going to play it out now anyway, so it doesn't matter. But a very interesting choice to go for Rod of Ruin. I mean, I guess it's just direct damage, right? You could poke someone for one every turn. And yeah, hope for the best. Really, I'm, I'm really, I'm puzzled by this choice. I wonder if there's a bigger, bigger picture. Anyway, Chris putting a counter on his uh, Thalit Devourer here. Oh, that creature. It's so funny you're playing with that creature, Chris. Tapping a land there in the right top corner, it seems. I wonder what he's going to do. Or maybe he's playing out that land. I'm not quite sure. Okay, tapping a plains. Tapping a two red mana, three mountains. Plains and three mountains. And tapping a green. What's he going to cast? Tapping some more stuff. Yeah, Chris's, Chris's side is getting more and more glitchy. Okay, there's a Hand of Justice. Oh, that's a super cool card. though. It's not going to be useful. Hand of Justice 2-6, I think, from Fallen Empires. You got to tap Hand of Justice and three other white creatures. And he hardly has any. He has no white creatures except for the hand. And then you can destroy any creature on the battlefield. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of good, but you need white creatures. And then we see Ishan here uh, looking at the top three cards again because of the Sylvan. Maybe, I mean, maybe Chris has more white creatures in hand there. Who knows? Only has two cards in hand, by the way. Ishan has, I believe, seven cards in hand now after the, uh, the draw. Let's see what he can do. Going to tap a green. Tap another green, a red. Ooh, a Tranquility! Oh, that's huge! This Tranquility is huge because it's going to take care of the COP red. Oh, Spell Blast, though. Spell Blast on the Tranquility. That is unfortunate. That is unfortunate. And no response from me, so it looks like I don't have anything uh, to do against it. No power sync, for example. So this tranquility is not going to happen. Ah, oh, that is unfortunate. Would have been so good. Because it would also destroy Ishan's own Sylvan, which is kind of nice. And of course, it would take care of the COP red, which is huge. It's so hard to deal damage to Jeff as long as its COP is there. But uh, yeah, Tranquility got spell blasted, so that's going to stay. Oh, a Dust to Dust, so he can now destroy two artifacts. 
Wow, so I guess it's the end for uh, Thomas's coffin. And he's also going to target maybe the Arena of the Ancients. And now we see Chris trying to cast an Avoid Fake, but Avoid Fake doesn't work on Sorcery. So I guess he's going to cast, going to target Arena of the Ancients and Thomas' Coffin with his Dust to Dust. So those two cards are now removed from the game. Yeah, this is also pretty big. Yeah, for me, of course, this is great. Only advantages for me here. And I mean, my Nico Bolas is still on the board. So I mean, I could attack with it. Ooh, there's a Chaos Orb. Wow. Yeah, of course he's shown having all these good cards. Why? Because he's been having the GM date home forever. And um, yeah, I just, I, I'm still hoping for some artifact destruction from my side to uh, take care of that tome. Or actually my steel artifact, that would be really good to just steal it. I'm sure Ishan will then of course flip his Chaos Orb on my steel artifact, but still, it's worth to try. But he is gonna use it straight away. What is he gonna use it on? So Ishan is using his Chaos Orb. I wonder what he's gonna flip on. Is he gonna flip maybe on the Maze of If of Jeff? Gonna flip, it's a hit. Very nice flip, by the way. Oh, of course, on the COP Red. Yeah, yeah, I forgot it was still there because the Tranquility got countered. Yeah, so flipping here, this is huge. Like, Jeff is losing two key pieces here. His Thomas' Coffin and his Circle of Protection Red. That is so big. Wow. Now it's my turn, of course, paying for uh, Nico Bolas, kind of reorganizing my uh, my lands here, it seems. Only one card in hand. That's a problem for me this entire game. I haven't really been able to, to draw any extra cards. Tapping three here, what's this? Oh, a living wall. That's a pretty good blocker, an 06. And I believe you can regenerate it for one. So I wonder if I'm gonna attack Chris with Nico Bolas. I feel like I kind of have to, right? If you can attack with Nico Bolas, you kind of have to. And one of the goals for me this game is to swing in with the with Nico Bolas at least once. Would be kind of nice. Yeah, there he goes, swinging in Nico Bolas, and I believe towards Chris. Why? Because Ishan and Jeff, of course, both have mazes. Oh, and look at that. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, man. I'm so sorry. He's going to also drop to nine. And, and look at that. He had a detonate in hand. Oh, that would have been a great uh, card to play on the uh, GM Day Tome of Ishan, actually. Yeah, maybe we should have communicated a little bit more here, Chris. I'm so sorry, man. But I just... I need to attack with Nico Bolas. That card is just too cool not to use. And now I had a swing. And that doesn't happen often. I mean, I've had to cast it three times this game, and this was the first time that I could actually attack with it. So I just had to go for it. So Chris now on nine, really in the danger zone. I'm actually on 11. I'm also in the danger zone, but I have some more defenses. And of course, I've got Jander Saddlebacks to uh, untap my Nico Bolas. Now, Jeff here. It's looking a little bit vulnerable, to be honest. He still has the maze, though, and of course, deck and a huge blocker. But doesn't have anything else really going for him. Passing the turn here to Chris, who's untapping. Let's see what he can do. Drawing a card for turn. Has to put a counter still on his Thalid Devourer. That goes to two. But I kind of, you know, this is, this is tough for Chris, this position. He's kind of like me, he's missing card draw. It looks like there's the pass turn of Chris and Ishan wants to do something on end step. Oh, we see Jeff here using his Rod of Ruin, dealing a damage to Ishan, I believe. So he's gonna go to 20, Ishan using his Karakas here on Deccan. Yeah, that makes sense. I wonder, ooh, if Ishan attacks Jeff, forcing Jeff to use the maze, then I can attack Jeff. 
Is that a good idea? Maybe not, because Ishan is really in the lead at the moment, but it's so cool to just attack with Nico Bolas. So Sir Chandelar finally untaps, by the way. Sir Chandelar is free! Yes! I love it. I really like the art of Sir Chandelar, and of course the name Chandelar. I have, of course, my own uh, Chandelar series here on the channel. In case you haven't seen it yet, check, check it out. You can find it on uh, the Timmy Talks YouTube page. And I'm currently playing my second run of Chandelar with a red and green deck. Anyway, uh, Ishan here on 20. He's still the highest in life total. Let's see what he can do. Who's gonna attack you with Jacques Levert and his giant spider and his Sir Chandler? Is everything going at Jeff? Everything is pointed towards Jeff. But this also means that it's kind of open for me as well to attack Ishan next turn. Now, of course, we cannot hear the audio, so maybe Ishan is first discussed with me. Okay, I'll attack Jeff with everything if you don't attack me. So this could be a deal that has been made. But looking at the table in the entire match, it looks like, looks like there haven't been a lot of deals going on. Here's the attack. Look at that. Jeff is on eight. Wow. Ooh, this is... Uh, what's her name again? This is a 4-4 four, four first striker, I believe. And... and um, she has legendary land walk. So if you have a legendary land, like an Urborg, you know, she's unblockable. But look at Jeff now. All of a sudden, Jeff's on eight. Hasn't used his mace. Which makes sense, because he's worried about my Nico Bolas, which is fair enough. Oh man, all of a sudden, the game is kind of going faster, right? But Ishan, Ishan is still in the best position. And I think, I mean, for me, it doesn't make sense to start attacking Jeff now because I kind of need Jeff's help against Ishan. The same thing goes for Chris. Like, I could attack Chris now again with Nico Bolas, but that, that seems pretty harsh. Maybe my best line here is actually to attack Ishan with Nico Bolas. Tapping a red, okay, for a soul ring. That's not very exciting. I was hoping for a, for a stone rain. But I think, I think I'm not playing a stone rain in this deck. That's a pretty big mistake. Should definitely put one in for the next game. Yeah, what to do here? I mean, it could keep Nico Bolas untapped, but it seems kind of lame. And I also have gender Settleback, so I think I should at least attack Ishan here. Look at this attacking. Am I attacking Ishan with everything? No, I'm attacking Jeff with everything. Oh, wow. I'm, 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 it's funny when I'm looking back at this and, 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 and my choices on who to attack seems a bit odd to me. But again, we can't hear the audio, of course. So maybe certain deals were made. It does look like it, to be honest, because me attacking Jeff kind of sounds like a deal. But I think I have to now break up the deal again with Ishan, because Ishan is really in the lead still. Okay, here's an air elemental by Jeff. 4-4 four, four flyer. A beautiful art, I believe, by Richard Thomas, who also did the art for Wall of Air. Those two cards really form a nice pair together. I play them together in the Timmy Spellbook. There we see Jeff tapping some more. Oh, there's um, Lady Evangela. This is a pretty good card. Like you can pay three mana, tap it, then target creature doesn't deal any combat damage. I mean, there's so many control pieces in Jeff's deck. And I'm not quite sure about the power and toughness of the lady. I, I wonder, because maybe I could just kill it with the uh, Orcish Artillery. Anyway, it's now Chris's turn. So Chris is tapping 
five mana. There's a creature there on the right. Is it a creature? Is it a thicket maybe? Yeah, Thicket Basilisk. That's actually kind of good. That's a good blocker. Thicket Basilisk hitting the board. But I think one of the problems for Chris here is that Pendlehaven, because that's a legendary land, meaning Ishan can use his creature with legendary land walk, which is a 4-4. Of course, he's first going to draw a card in end step of Chris. Oh man, he's drawn so many cards. Unbelievable. And again, looking back at this game, I'm like, yes, I managed to attack with Nico Bolas once, which was cool, but it would have been better to just discuss with Chris and Chris saying, listen up, I can get rid of the Jam Day Tome. If you don't attack me, I'll do that. You know, that would have made more sense. But um, yeah, I mean, it's different when you look back at these games, of course. Here we see Ishan untapping, taking on his turn. I mean, he's, he's in the best position to take this game. I mean, he's on 20. He's got the book. He's got the mace. He's got lots and lots of mana. He's got a full grip of cards in hand. And I mean, I'm on 11. I'm now the highest behind Ishan, which is funny because it was the lowest for the longest time. There he goes. He's going to attack with his 4-4 legendary land walk. I think he's gonna attack uh, Chris here. Yeah, gonna attack Chris. So Chris is now also on five. So Jeff and Chris on five. Oh, a fireball. Is he gonna try to take both players out? Whoa, this is pretty big. Does he have enough mana to kill both players with one fireball? That would be huge. I think he's got enough mana to do that because he just has to, he needs 12 mana, right? Because then he can deal five to Jeff, change targets, deal five to Chris. Yeah, 12 mana. I think he has that. So look at that. Chris on zero. Looks like Jeff is doing something though. What is Jeff going to do? Does he have an alabaster potion or something? Yeah, it's, it's called Alabaster Potion, right? <laughs> oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. So this is an instant that can give you X life or prevent X damage. A card from Legends originally. So look at that. Jeff is on um, Jeff is on three. Chris, the first player to get elimin eliminated here in this match. But I think things are going to go really, really quickly now. And uh, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to untap my artillery. Am I going to deal some damage to Ishan? But I also deal damage to myself here. No, I'm not. I was just untapping my artillery and probably changed my mind. Problem here is that I'm on 11. So yes, I can deal two damage to Ishan, but I deal three to myself. So it really makes no sense to do that. And I think I really need Jeff here, by the way, to, uh, to support me in my attack against Ishan. Okay, this is, this is actually kind of nice, this pirate ship. Because I can untap the pirate ship with Jandra Saddleback. So deal two damage a turn to Ishan this way. I mean, it's not, it's not the perfect plan, but at least it's a plan. Has Sir Chandelar being huge now because uh, I, I guess it also gets uh, the bonus from uh, Jacques Levert. Does it mean it's got nine toughness? That's kind of sick. Anyway, passing the turn here to Jeff. Jeff also has, of course, his Rod of Ruin, so could ping Ishan as well. So we could ping Ishan for, for three every turn if we work together. And it's also going to be tough for Ishan to deal damage to us, I think. Because I have no legendary land, so the legendary land walk is not going to work. And Jeff, of course, has his mace still, and that Lady uh, Evangela. So this, this, this is looking kind of, I mean, not great for us, but I think, I think if I work together with Jeff, we can at least deal some damage to Ishan. 
Let's first see if Jeff can do anything. Tapping two blue here, it seems. Oh, playing a juxtapose. Okay, <laughs> what does he want to do with that? So juxtapose a card where you can switch uh, a creature with your opponent and you can switch an artifact. And I think it's a creature with the highest casting cost and the artifact with the highest casting cost, I think. But I'm not sure if you want to do this. Because I think he has to give his Rod of Ruin to Ishan. Do you want to do that when you're on three? Looks like he's kind of thinking about that now as well. Like, is it actually a good move to do this? I mean, yes, you take his GM day tome, but you're going to give him a 4-4 flyer. I'm not sure if this juxtapose is really going to gonna be useful. Okay, so I did a made a little cut in the video because it's took quite long, actually. But at the end of the day, Jeff used his Rod of Ruin once. Then he gave Ishan his Rod of Ruin and Air Elemental. And I think they're now kind of figuring out what cards he's going to get back. And I guess those are the two cards that are turned around. So, I mean, he's getting back the Jam Day Tome and I think Sir Chandelar. I think those are the two cards that Jeff is getting. Still wonder if it's a good deal for Jeff, to be honest, because he gives that Rod of Ruin away. Anyway, here's a Disenchant. So maybe Disenchant's his own Rod. Oh, actually going to go for... Um... Yeah, so he's going to Disenchant his own Rod of Ruin. Exactly. Yeah, now it makes more sense. So basically what he did is trading his Rod of Ruin for his Gem Day Tome. So maybe that was the bigger deal. And then disenchanting his own Rod of Ruin. That makes sense. And he gets back in return now Sir Chandelar and the Gem Day Tome. I think, I think the problem for Jeff, though, is that the Air Elemental that he gi is giving to Ishan, of course, has flying. And I guess uh, Jeff is now passing the turn back to Ishan here. So he's still... I think put the Rod of Ruin in his graveyard or, or, okay, I'm a little bit puzzled now that Ishan is putting his uh, Sylvan Library in the graveyard because I believe the Disenchant went to the Rod of Ruin, which makes sense because Jeff's on three. So that means he gets to keep the Sylvan Library. Anyway, let's maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe they figure it out later. Let's just uh, have a look and see what Ishan can do. I think Ishan is probably going to find a way to kill Jeff. I mean, he's so low. I wouldn't be surprised. And remember, Ishan still has a ton of cards in hand. Okay, so there's a Black Lotus. Does that mean that he wants to do something big, that he needs all his mana? That would be kind of spectacular. So we'll have to wait and see here. Tapping the ruby. Tapping two mountains. Oh, there's a falling star. This is pretty cool. Yeah, so with falling star, you flip it from a height of one foot. And then everything it hits, all the creatures it hit, they take three damage and they become tapped. So it looks like he's going to target my pirate ship, which makes sense because it's got three toughness and my orcish artillery. And I think uh, the lady as well on the side of Jeff's uh, battlefield. Of course, he can take multiple targets. And this is going to be really hard to kind of try to figure out what targets he's going to get. But it makes sense to take the artillery and the pirate ship and the lady because they all have... I think the lady has two toughness. So if he, if he has a good flip, he can kill three creatures here with one falling star, which is kind of sick. So Ishan here kind of reorganizing his battlefield, probably gonna show what's what here. So here we've got two yellow creatures, two black creatures. Ooh, and he's about to flip. I wonder which is which. Okay, so I guess the yellow creatures are the pirate ship and the artillery and the black creatures are the lady and maybe another target on the side of, uh, of Jeff. Anyway, there's the flip. Good flip, Ishan. Wow, really nice flip. Um, yep, killing both of my creatures here and the lady on the side of Jeff. So this Falling Star 
It's worth quite a lot here. Jeffing responds using the lady one last time. I believe technically it has to do that before the flip, I think. But anyway, you can use it one more time so you can choose one creature that's not going to deal any combat damage. And yeah, it's always difficult because I don't have the audio as well, so I don't know whose creature he's going to target. But judging by his board, it's going to be either the Air Elemental or the 4 4 Landwalker, right? Because those are the biggest creatures. He only has one maze. So let's say, let's say he picked the Air Elemental, which is that yellow sleeve there, right? Because of the juxtapose, those two permanents got uh, changed. So that creature is not going to deal any combat damage. And then he can attack with the other two. And then Jeff still has a maze to send one back. Okay, so I guess he picked the 4 4 Landwalker then. Anyway, attacking with the other two. I'm expecting. Um... Oh, Jeff actually gonna die. He's on three. He's not gonna survive this, right? Oh, wait. I can untap Sir Chandelar with my. Uh, with my gender saddlebags. I can help Jeff here. <laughs> oh, so I'm untapping here, Sir Chandelar. And again, I'm not quite sure how on Jeff's side it works with the tokens, because I feel he's now using the air elemental to, to mimic Sir Chandelar. I don't know, but I'm what's happening here is I'm using my Thomas of my uh, gender saddlebag to untap the Sir Chandelar that Ishan just gave to Jeff, so he can use it as a blocker on the Jacques Levert. And then in response, Ishan is going to take his Jacques Levert out of combat with the Maze of If. So he's going to save Jacques Levert. And now he's going to play the Killer Bees. So, I mean, at least Jeff's still alive. And now the Sylvan comes back. Exactly, Ishan. It wasn't targeted. So, <laughs> so, man, this game is so messy. But I want to see it through now, right? I want to see, okay, who's going to win this? I still think Ishan has the best papers. But maybe, you know, I can squeeze out a victory. Who knows? I'm on 11. I've got pretty good defenses. Right? I've got a big flyer. I've got gender saddlebags. I've got living wool. I've got often trolls. Also re regenerators. So. And I think I did a good job with, um, with keeping Jeff alive here. I really need kind of Jeff to, to help me. Looks like I am going to make a play here. Ooh, I'm going to play a drain life. I wonder what I'm going to target here. So it's a drain life for four because I've got four black. What to drain? That's a big question. Remember, all the creatures of Ishan have plus O plus two because of that Jacques Levera. So four seems pretty good, but it's actually not that useful. I cannot even kill the killer bees. Oh, am I going to drain the air elemental? That could be a way to go. I could drain the air elemental. Okay, so I'm going to take care of the air elemental. That means I go back up also to 19. Or no, I was on 11, so I already went up to 15. Okay, fair enough. Now passing the turn to Jeff. Oh, man. I mean, Jeff, your board is its really unclear what you've got going on for yourself. <laughs> because you have, just to clarify, he's got Ishan's Sir Chandelar and he's got the Gem de Tome. Both of the permanents at the top there, the air elemental and the flipped card, they're both out of the game. So I'm not really sure why he's keeping them there. I think that's also what they're communicating about right now. I think those cards need to go out and maybe just put two flipped cards in to represent Sir Chandelar. And okay, there's a Sir Chandelar. And just use that other card for your Gem Day Tome. I think that can just work. And I think, I think Jeff, he really needs a miracle here to, to survive another turn. Exactly. I think this makes the most sense, right? So we've got Sol Ring. Then we've got that Sleeve, which represents Gem de Tome. Then we've got Sir Chandelar. And then he's got that flip card in his hand, which is Deccan uh, Black Blade. That's his commander. So I, th I think if you're Jeff, you're on three. Um, it's still survival mode, right? The problem here is that Ishan has got a lot of creatures as well. I mean, if Ishan next turn attacks with Killer Bees and with his uh, legendary Landwalker, then he can kill Jeff just by attacking with those. So 
So it's understandable here that Jeff's a little bit in the tank trying to figure out how can I stay alive. Ooh, there's a strip mine. Okay, he could strip the mace, which would be really good for me. Ooh, he could strip the Caracas. I forgot all about that. Ishan still has a Caracas. Man, he's been having that card for ages. So even if I try to attack him with my Nico Boas, he can just send it back to my hand. We see Jeff, by the way, using his Jam Day Tome to draw an extra card. Gonna tap two. Okay. So there's an Urza's Chalice. Now he's using the Chalice to gain a life from his own Urza's Chalice, but that actually doesn't work. You cannot use it to activate it on your own artifact. So he's still on three. But I believe we corrected that later. So he's now on four, but he will go back to three. Anyway, um, Jeff here playing a rocket launcher. Okay, so he could gain a life from that. So playing the rocket launcher. The problem with rocket launcher is gonna take a whole turn before he can use it. I wonder if he's gonna use the, um, the strip mine. The thing is, I think Ishan can use his Karakas to send back Sir Chandelar to his own hand. Because he's still the owner of the card. So I wonder, what is Jeff going to do? I think, I mean, there's not much that can save him. Of course, I'm hoping that he's still going to use the strip mine. Against or the Mace or the Caracas, both is fine. But yeah, Jeff really in, uh, in the tank here. Looking at his uh, Deccan. To play out Deccan or not. Why, just, if it's your last move, just do it. Although I think he doesn't even have the mana for it, so. He, he can strip something. Yeah, he's gonna strip the Caracas, it seems. Ooh, look at that, he's gonna use it to send it back to my hand. Oh, ho, ho, that's bad. I've got no flying blockers. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, I'm really worried now. That Killer Bees is looking really, really good right now on the side of Ishan because I've got no flying blockers. Maybe I'm going to die before Jeff. I wouldn't be surprised. Ooh, Jeff's going to tap some more. Oh, he does have enough mana to play uh, the Deccan. So it is going to hit the table. That's a pretty good blocker for Jeff, actually. That's pretty decent. So he's now on three, he's got a 12-12. Of course, taking damage from his own City of Brass there. Passing the turn to Ishan. Oh man, this game, this game is crazy. I mean, the thing is Ishan, at the end of the day, he still has to try to kill us and he still has two opponents to, to, to fight against. He's going to tap four here. Okay, two red and two white, it seems. What are we going to see? I mean, I'm really scared of that killer beast, to be honest. It's, oh, he's second the Lotus. Oh, he shatters Storm. Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. I'm going to lose my living wall. That's another blocker. Uh... Yeah, I can regenerate the Living Wall, but it's going to be tapped. And then I cannot untap it because it's going to be destroyed at the same time, unfortunately. So this taps my Living Wall. And of course, destroys the Jam Day Tome. Ay, 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 this is so bad. I'm on 15. I mean, look at that. His Killer Bees. How big can he make the Killer Bees? One, two, three, four, five. I think he's got five forests. 
Then he's got three duels that can make green, that's eight. And he's got Pendulave and that's nine. So he can attack for nine. Whoa, that's huge. That is huge. Oh, of course. Yeah, no Spirit Link on there. Why not? Oh, God. And here you can really see all those cards that Ishan drew more than all of us. That's now really paying off for him. I mean, I've got two cards in hand. Jeff has no cards in hand. One of my, my cards is my commander anyway. And I think Ishan still has, what, five cards in hand? Four, it seems. Still a lot compared to, uh, to the both of us. I wonder if he can kill us both. I think he's... Is he now attacking me? Then I wonder if Jeff is going to use his mace. So he's going to pump it up for two, three. So three, four, five. So taking five damage, you're going to ten. And Ishan, of course, going up five. So he's going to go to 24, right? Oh, no. Jeff is using the maze. Go, Jeff. That is great. Thank you, Jeff. And I think, of course, Ishan also could have gone for Jeff here by attacking with that legendary Landwalker and with the Killer Beast. But deciding to first go after me, which kind of makes sense. I'm maybe a little bit more dangerous, although... I mean, we're both, both of us are pretty meaningless, to be honest. Anyway, uh, untapping. I just need something from the top here. Something really, really good. I wanted to say a Wrath of God, but I'm not playing with white, so. Maybe an Earthquake? That could be good, maybe. Tapping four. What are you going to see for four? Two black and two. Well, two black and two red. Let's see what, it, what it's going to be. Two cards in hand. Well, three cards after the draw, actually. Ooh, there's a Pestilence. This is pretty big. I can then... Pestilence for four. I can deal four damage. That can, that can kill a lot of creatures, to be honest. If I do a Pestilence for four... Looks like I'm, I'm just casting my Nicobolas. I think I'm doing this a little bit too quick. I think if I do a Pestilence for four... I could kill... Mm, yeah, I think I could kill the Killer Beast because there are three green on the side. Anyway, deciding not to do that. I think that's... I'm, I think I'm going a little bit too hasty. I think I'm making a mistake. If I would have paid four, I think I would have killed the Killer Beast. I would have killed Jacques. So as soon as Jacques dies, all the, that plus O plus two bonus goes away. And remember, the damage stays on the creatures for the whole turn. Yeah, so that would have basically wiped his entire board. I think I made a mistake here to just pass turn and play out the, uh, the Nicol Bolas. So I believe I had four black. Anyway, decided not to do it. Jeff not doing much as well, just passing the turn. So it's up to Ishan now. Yeah, he's probably just going to attack me, right? And then I'm kind of forced to block with my Nicobolas. He could, of course, again go for Jeff. Try to kill Jeff here. So, yeah, let's see what Ishan's going to do. And I think we're also discussing how Jacques Levert kind of works and... It's pretty obvious, right? If I would Pestilence for four, Jacques Levert dies. Then the bonus goes away and the damage is still on a creature. So that would also kill the 4-4 Landwalker and the 2-4 Giant Spider because they're no longer 2-6 and 4-6. And then, of course, he could keep maybe the Killer Bees alive because he's got a lot of green mana. Like the Killer Bees is looking really, really good here for, uh, for Ishan. But at the moment, of course, I only have two black open from the Badlands and the um, Underground Sea. So Ishan turning the Killer Bees is sideways. And I guess, is he going to attack me? That would make the most sense. 
Or not. Ooh, or attacking Jeff instead. I mean, if he attacks me, Jeff's probably just going to use his maze again. So going to attack Jeff here. If he attacks Jeff, I think he's dead. Because he cannot block the uh, that 4-4 four because four, it's got legendary land walk. I think he's just going to die. Like, he can use the maze on one of the two creatures. And I think Jeff is now realizing this as well. Does he still have a card in hand? I don't think so. Maybe one? Is this the end of Jeff here? That is the question. Using the maze. Ooh, and maybe Sean is attacking me instead. I'm not quite sure now. But I mean, if he is, oh, I can see what Ishan's doing. Of course, you're such a smart player, Ishan. I'm so stupid. He's attacking me with the killer bees and Jeff with the 4-4. Forcing Jeff to use his maze on the 4-4 and forcing me to block the killer bees. That's exactly what happens here. So we see Ishan bumping up the killer bees. He's going to gain seven life. Look at that. Going to go up to 26. He's going to uh, not even going to lose the killer bees. I'm going to lose... My, um, my Nico Bolas. Yeah, that, this, this is really smart, Ishan. This is the way to go, actually. But now I do have that window to wipe the board with my Pestilence. And yes, I'm going to kill Jeff in the process, but I think, in all honesty, that's my only window, because right now Ishan has tapped so, uh, so many green mana that I have an opening here to use my Pestilence. Anyway, let's first see if maybe Ishan wants to do something else. Because this after his attack, so he's now in his second main. Yeah, sorry, it took me a moment to realize that Ishan was actually attacking Jeff and me. Very clever, Ishan. Or is it Jeff and I, by the way? Anyway, uh, Ishan here passing the turn. Man, what a match this is. We're two and a half hours in, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, now I'm using the Pestilence for four. I gotta regenerate my troll twice, by the way. That's how it works these days. Exactly, gotta regenerate it twice. I'm so sorry. I feel kind of bad, Jeff, that I'm killing you here. Because you've been helping me out, but I think this is the only way for me. I guess, and again, looking back at it, you realize these things. I guess I might as well have... Allow Jeff to have one more draw, right? But of course I want to try to win this. So I'm pestling, playing Pestilence for four. I'm dropping to 11. Jeff is out of the game. Um, Ishan is going to drop four life as well. He's going to go to 22. And I mean, I still have Pestilence. So I guess I just got to hope for the best. Of course Ishan still has his Sylvan. So now Ishan is going to take his turn. He can look at the top three cards, exactly. But I'm not unhappy. I'm in a better position than I thought, and I could actually maybe win this. I mean, I've got enough control. Oh, end of the road. Or do I have a counterspell? Am I going to lose to a disintegrate? Please, counterspell. Oh, how from beyond? Oh, I just needed that opening. To play that Howl from Beyond, I could have done a lot of damage that way. Oh, man. Yeah, I would have found a Tetsumo. But in all fairness, Ishan, yeah, it's, it's, you're supposed to win this, I think. You or Jeff, you've, you had the best boards for the longest of time. And what a marathon match this was. And to be honest, when you play EDH 93, 94, this is pretty much what happens all the time. You have really, really long games. So if you ever want to do this, make sure you have your timetable cut out that you've got at least three hours to just, you know, play the game, talk BS, you know, and just have fun because these games take a long time. Um, I would like to thank you for watching this episode. Let me know in the comments below if you've watched it in one go, because I mean, then you have my admiration. 
Um, and also before you go, please take a moment to like, comment and share this on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. Talking about helping the channel move forward, you can also become a patron of the show. Check out patreon.com slash timmytalks to find out how you can become a supporter of the show. Uh, by becoming a patron. So um, yeah, that would be highly appreciated. And if you become a patron at the $2 tier level, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every single video. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? 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 Zing!